welcome to the Falmouth Chamber of Commerce. The Falmouth Chamber is dedicated to working on behalf of our members to make Falmouth a better place to live, work, and conduct business. We are committed to developing the economic, cultural, educational, and civic interests of our community and welcome the support from all organizations to achieve our combined goals. Whether you call Falmouth home, are a summer resident, or a visitor, we hope you take advantage of all that the Chamber has to offer. Nestled in a classic New England setting amid 200-year-old elm trees and charming colonial homes, stately sea captain's homes, and charming Cape Cod salt boxes, Shoreway Acres is a graceful blend of Cape Cod's past and present. Shoreway Acres, proud sponsor of Falmouth Community Television. Green Harbor Waterfront Lodging is nestled in a woodland setting on a picturesque ocean inlet. Green Harbor offers a family waterfront vacation. Enjoy our private boating beach with dock, rowboats, and paddle boats, oversized heated outdoor pool and kiddie pool. Relax in our waterfront and beachside accommodations. 548-4747 or gogreenharbor.com. People think that a locally owned and operated appliance store may not offer what they need. Actually, we have trained and dedicated sales associates, expert delivery and installation, professional repair service, and personal customer service. Plus, we have access to a huge local warehouse with over 6,000 models in stock. Crane Appliance. We call the Cape and Islands home. Carlson Printing for all your printing needs. 508-548-7303 or toll free at 1-800-696-7303. Our email address is carlsonprinting at aol.com. Carlson Printing for all your printing needs. Hosting services for FCTV.org are provided by Meganet Communications. Meganet offers a wide array of internet services including Mega Backup Cloud Service, Server Co-location, T1, Fiber, Metro Ethernet, as well as telephone services such as hosted PBX and Digital Voice. Their number one goal is to keep your communications network up and running and allow you to focus on growing your business. 877-634-2638 or Meganet.net. The Quarter Deck Restaurant, located on Main Street in the heart of Falmouth, specializing in fresh local seafood and other classic American cuisine, featuring a full bar with friendly staff, and the Bucatino Restaurant and Wine Bar, located in North Falmouth, just off Nathan Ellis Highway, featuring catering services with two full event rooms serving up classic Italian cuisine. The Quarter Deck Restaurant and Bucatino Restaurant and Wine Bar, we're here to serve all our friends in Falmouth.
Good evening. Welcome to the October 26, 2020 Falmouth Select Board meeting. Um, we are, um, I'm going to call the meeting to order in open session. So um, if when I say your name, just um, say present. Uh, Nancy Taylor. Taylor present. Sam Patterson. Patterson present. Doug Brown. Brown present. Doug Jones. Jones present. Okay, and Megan English Braga present. We also have uh, Julian Suso, town manager present, um, and a number of other staff here uh, for this evening. So um, we are going to go um, into executive session pursuant to Mass General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 21A2, to conduct strategy, strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or contract negotiations with non-union personnel, town manager contract. Um, and I would note that not to uh, conduct this business in executive session could place the town at a disadvantage. Patterson second. Okay, um, all those in favor by roll call. Patterson? Patterson, aye. Taylor? Taylor, aye. Brown? Brown, aye. Jones? Jones, aye. Okay, so we are going to adjourn to um, executive session and we will return when we have finished our business um, in that session. Thank you. I think we'll just go forward. Okay. Seems like whenever it's uh, rainy weather, we have bad internet. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, welcome. I'm going to call um, the October 26, 2020 Thalma Select Board meeting back into um, open session. We have just returned from executive session and um, I have previously called the meeting to order and noted um, the attendance of all members of the board. Sam Patterson is just, I think, trying to reconnect. Uh, we also have town manager Suso, assistant town manager Peter Johnson Staub, and our IT um, staff here to assist us. Um, so let's start by um, uh, Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the republic, the republic for, for which it stands. stands one, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and, justice and justice for all. For all. Thank you. Uh, we don't have any proclamations tonight. Um, I have something for um, recognition, um, but I does anyone else have anything? Um, Doug Brown, did you have anything? I was just going to mention appreciation for our own town clerk and their staff and the hard work that they've done and very effectively managing this whole early voting and mail-in voting and providing an additional staffing at the uh, former senior center. So I think they're doing a great job and hats off to town clerks nationwide because what a big change for them and a massive 
massive extra work. So I'm glad to, yes. glad they're doing it because look at the results. We've got a lot of people that have already voted. The turnout in the last election when we had the voting was so much higher than average. I think it's going to be a record turnout this time. Yes, no, good point. Doing a lot of good work. Nancy? I just want to recognize um, the town's IT staff, you know, doing all of this Zoom and trying to keep us all um, online and up and going. They've been fabulous. Anytime I've reached out, they're, they're extremely responsive, and I'm, I really do appreciate their work. So I, I just wanted to call them out. Great. Thank you. Yes. And it's just kind of an ongoing labor uh, because the challenges are constant. Um, I had one that is, um, I actually received a phone call from a resident today um, who had a very upsetting incident take place um, and had called uh, Falmouth Police Department to uh, report the incident. And she couldn't have said kinder things about whomever, and I won't say who the individual is because I didn't clear this with them, but the individual at dispatch who took her call, um, essentially this is, this is a woman who was doing some yard work and found um, what was a doll head. It was a, a black doll head. And on the forward of it, it said N word lover because um, and it was thrown on her yard and she had some black lives matter signs up and she was actually doing some of this yard work with her grandson, who is, a, I think, a tween or a teen. And of course, she was, he was, he saw this object and she was absolutely horrified. Um, and I, in the picture, my description doesn't really do it justice. When you see it, it's very upsetting. And um, she called, as we tell everybody, you know, if there are issues of this type, you call the police department. And she did. And she said that the person who took that call was so compassionate and sympathetic and really that kind of steady response that helped in that moment. I um, mean, obviously the police came out and took what is now evidence um, and who knows, these things are hard to ever go forward with and, and prosecute because folks do these things in a really cowardly way and, um, you know, usually do it in a way that can't be traced. But um, you know, the folks at dispatch, we usually interact with them and never see their faces, but this individual um, who knows who they are really made a difference. And that was one of the things that um, this uh, resident wanted me to know. And so um, I just wanted to remind people, you know, that this is a heightened time and that people um, engage in this kind of behavior, but that the response really is to do exactly as she did and report these things because they are they are crimes if they're meant to intimidate somebody or frighten them or if it does damage to personal property. Um, and we have those folks at dispatch who will uh, respond in a way that, um, it, as it did in this situation, really made um, her feel, you know, supported. So I just want to thank that individual um, for you know, really just taking the time to go above and beyond, not just taking a call in and sending somebody out, but really making um, this woman feel that somebody heard her and really cared for what she was uh, talking about. So thank you to that to that uh, town employee. Um, hopefully they can get some fingerprints off of that doll. Hopefully, I, I know they're gonna try, you know, these things are tough, but, um, but you know, certainly unfortunate when a child sees that as well. Um, mm -hmm. Doug Jones? I appreciate your pointing out the uh, dispatch officer who did the right thing, but I think we all want to just agree how egregious and horrible this that this should happen in our town, and there yes. is no business, there's no place for it. Um, it is just despicable, and as you said, immature, and um, the behavior to be that that kind of uh, soft and weak to be able to do it in that way is is absolutely horrendous. Yes, no, it's. That's for sure. and, not to minimize, not to minimize, um, you know, these are the exact type of tactics that folks have used for many decades to intimidate and scare people. And in fact, um, you know, it really is just an exercise in, in cowardice and it doesn't have a place in our town. And so um, I know that I think there'll be some other news we'll hear about this as as we go forward. And I know she has a lot of support from folks within the community. So thank you for emphasizing that, Doug. Um, any other announce, uh, how about announcements? Any announcements? Yes, Julian. Yeah, Chair, I think um, 
I'd like to announce uh, uh, publicly that we have uh, the, the board will first recall that back in June we had applied for a um, community development block grant uh, COVID uh, uh, funding, which was a special purpose funding uh, put in place through the Commonwealth, uh, federally funded um, for municipalities uh, to secure assistance for certain related uh, activities. And we had brought forward a, uh, an application, which the board uh, endorsed for both an economic development component, as well as uh, uh, some support for the service center and the fine work that they do during this time of pandemic. And um, curiously, as you will recall, um, the uh, State Department of Housing and Community Development indicated that they did not have a record of, of having received uh, our application. Uh, we have been working um, diligently uh, behind the scenes and uh, DHCD to their credit indicated that uh, uh, they would accept uh, a, a resubmission uh, from us. And uh, uh, I recently received notification from DHCD. Uh, the paperwork is still uh, to be forthcoming in to its full extent, but an indication that the town of Falmouth is indeed going to be funded uh, for an application for a grant uh, in a, uh, we had applied for $400,000, which was the maximum amount uh, which you could request. And the uh, indication that I received was that we would be funded in an amount up to $320,000. Uh, again, I don't have a final contract yet. We're still working through some details because obviously we need to uh, shrink uh, and adjust the uh, size of the grant request, which we submitted because we attempted to set the bar high and secure as much funding as possible uh, for you know, the eligible uh, individuals in our community. Uh, so that is a work in progress, but I want to share the good news with members of the board and uh, obviously the public as well. Um, we were very concerned uh, when uh, this oversight had occurred and there was no record of this having been received, but the state to their credit has stepped up and is working with us. And I will uh, keep the board posted as this uh, further unfolds and the details uh, continue uh, to come in. So great news and we look forward to sharing that uh, those taxpayers dollars to benefit uh, as we had originally outlined. Great, the great news. Thank you, Julian. And That's great thank news. Thanks for everyone who kept on top of that. Those funds are gonna be uh, much needed. So that's great news. Um, under announcements, anything else? I did wanna make one just general announcement. Lots of folks have sent us um, emails about the Mayflower project um, and we have received all of them. Doug Brown has been very good trying to keep up with responding to them. There have been quite a few. If you have sent it, we have received it, we have read it. And it, um, we don't anticipate that it's going to, you know, it's an issue that's going to be back on our agenda um, in, you know, coming months. But we don't, we do want to make sure that folks know that we've read all of those comments and concerns. And Nancy, uh, Megan, if I could follow up, Nancy and I met with Mayflower last week over a Zoom conference and just kind of outlined our concerns and the basic information that we feel like should be shared prior to moving forward. So they're in the midst of trying to assemble that type of information. And I think they'll be back to us as soon as they get that together. Yep, Nancy, did you wanna just uh, give it, since we're in announcements anyway, we can just, is there, did you wanna just sort of speak to that so, for a minute? Yeah, so I just wanted to add to that. Um, I think we were, um, and Doug certainly disagree with me, but I think we were really clear about um, sort of the lack of information, particularly around health and safety, which, you know, our, our biggest concerns. Um, and Absolutely. They did not have that at really at that moment. At, they had some, um, but making sure that we get information out to the public um, before and, any decision would be made on any I, testing or moving forward. I, I agree with that statement. And also I did make that very clear to the Mayflower Wing people that the primary concern we're getting from residents is public health and safety. Not really anti-win, just you know, make sure you get the facts and, and understand what you're agreeing to. And also that we're Great. charged with, yep, with getting the information and making sure that we 
make a decision based on what's best for Falman. Right. Yep. Great. Thank you both for doing that. And, and that process will continue. Doug Jones. Uh, just to reiterate some of the responses to the emails that our later uh, item on the agenda has nothing to do with Mayflower. Right. Yes, <laughs> we did get some emails about that and I know it can be confusing, so. Right. Okay, great. We are going to move on to public comment. I don't, does anyone have any public comment that they were asked to read into the record? Yes, there was something and I'm going to have to Was it from Judy it. Ziss? Was um, it the one about um, the, one about the fire station. Okay. okay. One about the fire station. If you if you have one there that you want to read, go ahead and I'll look at this other one. I That's think okay. she was. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Doug Jones. The fire station was later in the agenda, so. So it wouldn't come under public comment. Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't think I think the one from Judy Ziss said public comment, but I believe it was public comment um, during the comment period for the diversity um inclusion diversity equity and inclusion position i don't think she was asking it to be i just checked i don't think she was asking for it to be read during public comment okay well if anybody um shares any public comment while we're going on here i will return to it um, and just a reminder for folks you can participate in this meeting in real time by going to the select board um website on the town uh, falmouth website and go to our page and you'll see the instructions for joining this Zoom meeting. You can use the chat function um, to ask questions or make comments. Um, you can also, as we just discussed, send comments to us in advance if you'd like for us to read those into the record, either during public comment or um, on a particular issue. So um, folks can continue to do that. Okay. Um, I see that Sam is with us on the telephone. so. Because I can't see you, Sam, if you want to chime in on something, please just go right ahead. All right, thank you. Okay. All right, we're going to go under summary of actions. License, application for new Common Victor License Train Bridge View LLC DBA Sweet Rice located at 167 T Ticket Highway, East Falmouth. Um, we have all of the paperwork. Is the applicant present? who's in um peter or julian do we have any idea if the applicant or their counsel was planning to be present I do have a name for the individual that we were expecting but i do not see that individual among the attendees Okay, so why don't we hold this for a moment and um, Galaxy Note Nine potentially? Yeah, I, we'll check on that. Okay, will you just check and see on the the unnamed one? Okay, um, so we'll set that aside for just a moment. Okay, next we have um, under ad administrative orders, vote to accept FY twenty twenty bulletproof vest partnership program award in the amount of seven thousand eight hundred nine dollars and fifty four cents. I'm going um, to accept the award. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. I'll second. Okay. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none. All those by roll call. Um, Taylor. Taylor, aye. Jones. Jones, aye. Brown. Brown, aye. Patterson. Patterson, aye. English Braga, aye. Great. Thank you. That will go a long way. Good job getting that grant. Yes. Um, okay, next we vote to adopt and execute order of taking for William Road. Um, Mr. Suso, are you going to present on this or do we have? Um, oh, I yeah, see we, we have Frank here. We were expecting Frank Duffy to uh, make okay. Duffy have Frank with us. If there he is, perfect. Bring him yep. on the video. If we could bring Frank, I know he's. it looks like he's joining us now to walk us through this process. Good evening again, Frank. Yes. Uh, so the, the matter before you is to adopt the order of taking for the layout of William Road. Um, 
William Road is a road in North Falmouth that runs from the backyard, basically, of the North Falmouth School over to Quaker Road. There are a number of residences on the road, but it is also the site of the new Silver Beach wastewater treatment plant. Um, we have actually owned this road uh, since about 1959, I think, when we acquired the site of the North Falmouth School. We also acquired the rights to this road. So although it has been a town-owned road, it is not a town way. It is basically a private road owned by the town, which sounds kind of strange, but there is such an animal. Um, for a number of years, the um, uh, DPW has been advocating that we take this road and make it a public way uh, because the town uses it very heavily to service the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and in all fairness to the owners of the road, we should be maintaining it as a public way and have status as a public way. So uh, the town approved this article, Article 23, at the town meeting, which we recently concluded. I have prepared an order of taking, which will include a legal description, a list of the abutters, and also a certified copy of the town meeting vote, which will be in the town manager's office tomorrow for your approval uh, and signature, by the way. There's also a plan there, which has been prepared by the um, town engineer, which you, uh, part of your duties is to endorse that plan. And these will be recorded in the registry of deeds. I understand that the um, town manager has sent to you in your package earlier uh, last week, the, uh, a copy of the order of taking, which you will need to look at to, uh, to approve, um, and perhaps also a copy of the plan, but it's a, it's a fairly straightforward, um, taking and uh, there will be because of the presence of the wastewater treatment plant on the road there will be no betterments assessed against the owners of abutting property um, we'll just go in there build the road to town standards and they'll get it basically for free because their neighbor is the wastewater treatment plant okay thank you thank you very much frank any questions for frank doug jones uh, which budget will this incur under and do we have any idea of the cost uh, I've been told that the DPW will take care of this within the, their current budget. Um, I don't know how much it will cost, um, but there's, they did not ask for any special appropriation to take care of this. Great. Okay, great. Any other questions? I move the approval of the taking William Road in North Falmouth. Okay. A second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? It seems there is a benefit to living next to a wastewater treatment plant. Yes. <laughs> um, it looks like we've lost Sam again, but we have a quorum, and I, I think we'll go forward and vote it, and I hope hope he can sort out the tech problem. So um, by roll call, uh, Taylor? Taylor, aye. Jones? Jones, aye. Brown? Brown, aye. Patterson? Patterson, aye. Thank you. And English Braga I. Oh, and there he is. Perfect. Welcome back. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Frank. We appreciate that. And just to remind everyone, they do need our signatures. So try to make a stopover. I, I saw Diane today and everything's already ready to go. So it's in the in the office there. Um, all right. Approve warrant for state election on November 3rd, 2020. Okay, we have that copy of that in front of us. Any questions? I'd move approval uh, with the uh, stipulation, just to make sure everyone understands the precinct two John DeMello Senior Center is the senior center on Dillingham Avenue. Patterson second. Oh, oh, Nancy, hold on, Nancy has um, a question, go ahead. Just on page three, um, they spell Sam's name wrong. <laughs> oh, Sanuel. Yeah. Very, very <laughs> exotic sounding. So if we can uh, correct that, uh, Mr. Suso. I'll bring that to the attention of the town clerk, no problem. Thank you. Um, I, do, do you think that we need to, um, to Doug Jones's point, do we need to just clarify that for folks, the, the, the senior center? Are people are going to be confused now that we have a new senior center? Should we say John DeMello Senior Center, Dillingham Ave? To clarify, I, I mean, I don't know how much of a confusion it is, but if people are voting for the first time, it might be confusing. They don't want us to call it the old senior center. That's right. The former senior center. <laughs> yeah. 
So maybe we can, you know, I don't know if that needs clarification, but. We'll bring that, we'll bring that to the clerk's attention as well. Okay. All right, great. So with that correction for Sam's name, um, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Taylor? Taylor, aye. Jones? Jones, aye. Brown? Brown, aye. Patterson? Patterson, aye. English Braga, aye. Okay. Uh, all you, right, Nancy. next. Thank you. Um, next, we um, are going to authorize chair to execute document in support of retirement board. Mr. Suso, we have a letter in our packet, but um, does anyone have any questions? Madam Chair, I can make a couple of brief comments. The, uh, the if you could, just board, for the public, thank you. Certainly. Um, the Retirement Board is establishing a new internet domain uh, for their uh, basic activities through the internet, emails, et cetera. And uh, because it involves a, a domain uh, that's titled uh, falmouth.gov, it does require the approval of the town. Uh, this is, of course, falmouthretirement.gov, but nonetheless, uh, the select board would need to approve, authorize and approve that going forward. And this letter would so affirm if the board is agreeable. Okay, any questions? Sam? Okay. Does that additional domain cost the town anything? No, it's uh, fully paid by the retirement board. They're uh, fully obligated and responsible. I believe it's four hundred dollars a year. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Okay. Do I have a motion? I'd move approval. Jones. Patterson, a second. Okay. I have a motion, a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none. By roll call. Taylor. Taylor, aye. Jones. Jones, aye. Brown. Brown, aye. Patterson. Patterson, aye. Great, thank you, thank you, Mr. Suso. Okay, next we have um, a discussion update on COVID-19 issues. I would suggest we go back to Sweet Rice. It's a common victual license, which generally does not, add, we don't require them to be here as they are for a liquor license. I'm, I'm fine with that, and is, as long as the board is comfortable with it. Well, the menu sure looked great. I've eaten there twice, it's excellent, so. <laughs> um, so unless anyone has any questions, these are, I can tell you, I believe they're folks who have, um, they have had some long standing um, connections in the restaurant industry. It's not their first go around. So they are, uh, I think, pretty seasoned in knowing what to expect. Can you explain to me why we're having a license at this time if they're already open? I think there was, I, I can only say what I sort of tangentially know, which is I believe they had counsel who, advised them that this process had taken place and it had not. That is my understanding. And so when it was brought to their attention, they closed immediately and then resubmitted some of this paperwork. So they're not offering right now because of this need? Correct. They've been closed, I think, since earlier this week or maybe even the end of last week. Yeah, excuse me. It's Monday. Since last week. Well, I would move. We get them back open again, so I'd move approval. Okay. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Okay. Okay, Brown second. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Taylor? Taylor, aye. Jones? Jones, aye. Brown? Brown, aye. Patterson? Oh, maybe we lost up. Sam again. Okay, English Braga, aye. Okay, thank you. Um, and now I'll, um, we'll bring Scott back on. Welcome, Scott. Scott McGann, our health agent. Good evening. Hi, everybody. Hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Okay, right, great. So, can I share screen, please? Okay. Is everybody seeing it okay? Yes. All right. Yes. So, let's start. Up, okay, let's start up here. So, where are we? Well, we've got some bad and some good. Here's the state map, and that's updated. Uh, every Wednesday and it's this collects data from the 4th to the 17th and you can see there's a lot of red there and if you haven't been uh, watching it um, there's been an increase nationally and, and definitely statewide so you see a lot of red um, which are more than eight cases per 100,000 you also see some asterisks there uh, the asterisks are important uh, down below if you can see it I hope you can is um, 
if you have 10 or more confirmed cases in the last 14 days from congregate care, or more than 30% of the total cases, they'd put an asterisk. And what that is, is if it's uh, long-term care, uh, a couple of towns this uh, sort of stemmed from had prisons with large outbreaks. And so you're deciding on what phase you're going to be on and how school's going to be open. Sometimes those aren't relevant. So um, they started this past week using the asterisk. As you can see there, the, the line between good and bad right now is sort of the bridge. Um, you know, we can see that the Cape's doing better. Going back to the state, you can see we're averaging over now the last few days over a thousand cases a day. Um, the, you know, if you look at this chat, this happens to be this past, this came out about four o'clock. You see about 20,000 people are tested, new, new individuals every day. So the testing has been pretty robust. Um, the death rate has been between 10 and 25 every given day, roughly. So the state's definitely on an upward trend. Uh, down below, you can see uh, percent positivity. We're up 111% from our low of about mid-September. You always want to see that number less than 1%. Over 1% tells you that it's um, starting to community spread. So that's statewide, uh, you're starting to see an increase. Coming over to Falmouth specific, this is the chart. And um, I'm sorry if you can't see it really well. Our total case count now is 296. So this week we'll probably go over 300. Um, hopefully not, but you know we're getting kind of close to 300. Uh, the good news is that since late May, you can see that we averaged less than 10 cases a week. And when, in the past two weeks, we've had nine cases. So that's a lower trend that we had uh, the past several weeks uh, previous to that. Uh, um, I think if we're staying below 10, because if I flip over to the next one, I want you to look at total tests last 14 days, 2479. That's 1,200 tests per week on average. And if we can stay less than five, six cases out of that many cases, that's pretty good, right? So our percent positivity was down to 2.1. Uh, which was lower than Barnstable County. If you come down here, you see 2.4. So countywide, we're doing good. And Falmouth, we're, doing, we're holding our own. We're, so we've sort of been in the same pattern with a lower trend over the last week. If you look at the state, they're going in the opposite direction statewide. You can see the positivity rate's 9.2. So everybody knows about the travel ban. Um, Massachusetts would fail its own travel ban test. So that's a little on the high side. Um, and that's what's been happening. So it looks like the Cape's been holding its own. Hopefully it can stay. Barnstable countywide, you can see that on every given day, they've been somewhere below 10. Uh, a couple of days here, here and there, 13. But if you come over here, this is today's data, you can see that Barnstable County had 24. So that was on the high side for what you normally would see with Barnstable County. Uh, good, um, the hospitalizations are both zero today. And that's real key. It's not, it's more, you know, to me personally, if, if every, you know, if you're getting a lot of mild cases, that's one thing. If you're getting a hospitalization, the surge and all the stuff that we we're talking about, that's a much more uh, serious issue. So that's kind of where we are as a town uh, with COVID. So we were, we're holding our own. Um, and I've been with this, talk to the schools on a daily basis to see how it's going. So we've got pretty good coordination now with the schools. You know, as we get started, so that's really a key to be able to jump on things quickly if they if they come up. Um, so that's COVID. Um, flu clinic wise, we had the flu clinic today. I thought it went really well. We did about 200. The average wait was far less. It was about 10 minutes max, which isn't bad if you have to wait 10 minutes to get the shot from getting into the Gus Canty all the way out. A nurse takes about uh, two to three minutes a car, plus a little bit of paperwork and things of that nature. And of course, I want to say I want to thank CERT. CERT sent me about eight people, eight to ten people, which really helps. You know, the VNA sent uh, three nurses and uh, an administrator. Uh, Joe Olenek helped me set up today, so thanks, Joe. And of course, my staff all worked in the rain. I'm still drying out from it. It was a little drizzly, and I did, but I, I did saw not you guys setting up, and I thought. It's been so beautiful. And of course, this day, it's going to rain all day long. Yeah, nothing worse than cold hands on a nurse, right? Yeah. Giving you a needle. <laughs> so they, we tried to keep them warm. I think if I had to do it again, I'd have rented a couple of hot air blowers for the poor nurses that had to do it. You know, everybody else can suffer. But um, it, went, it, went fair, it went really well. Um, and um, it gives us a good throughput to see if we have to go in the future. You know, if we have to start doing COVID and we probably, you know, when we, where we, we do it, what's our throughput per nurse is a good, it's a good indicator of where we are. And so, um, you know, still drying out from it. And it went, it went fairly well. Scott, could you remind us what CERT is? Oh, it's the, it's the emergency response team. It's volunteers. 
Okay. It's a Dan Donato's group of volunteers that they, they come to the, our uh, LEPC meetings on a core. We used to have them on a quarterly basis before COVID and they, they are a volunteer group that help with emergency preparedness. And what does CERC right stand for? Do you know? Oh, geez. I can look it up. Give me one second. Well, it's not important. I just appreciate that. <laughs> it's emergency. Res- it's emergency response team. I think it's community emergency response team is what it stands for. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Dan Donato runs it. And Dan, Dan, I spoke to Dan last week and he was able to corral eight to 10 people and that helps with the traffic flow. Yeah. Well, thanks to them for that. Yeah. Any questions for Scott? Okay. Yeah, we keep, uh, keep up the good fight, everybody. You know, we're doing yeah. pretty well. Yeah. And we've been pretty good so far. None of these things, uh, looking at the low numbers and not seeing any asterisks, we haven't really, and I'm knocking on wood, but our congregant living um, facilities have been doing fairly well. Yeah, so they do get occasional a positive test. They're testing probably on average every two weeks. So everybody gets tested every two, three weeks, I believe. And so they're getting an occasional, but it's not going to blow it hasn't been blowing up inside the place so you might get a you know, let's say a, a symptomatic or asymptomatic uh you know employee mm-hmm. and it, those haven't been shown to be all of a sudden you get nine ten cases or whatever happens and that's positive and it's it's got to do with you know getting get a handle on it and they've done, done a fairly good job getting a handle on things right so and that's always key that's probably the only thing that would get us an asterisk because we don't have a prison we don't have a lot of congregate living um that would be large enough other than our long-term care facilities. Thank you. Any other questions for Scott? Yes, Julian. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Just wanted to uh, note, I know we spoke about this last week, but of course, Halloween is this coming Saturday. And as the board's aware, we talked about that last time and issued a, a list of do's and don'ts uh, to help guide uh, residents uh, and young people who are gonna be uh, involved in any types of uh, trick-or-treat or Halloween traditional gatherings to use the cautions placed in the do's and don'ts. And uh, I think it's gotten fairly widespread uh, uh, viewership and read. Uh, we had a neighboring community contact us and indicate that they were uh, going to borrow our do's and don'ts list, essentially, because they thought it was a very effective way of communicating to the public about uh, things that they could do to stay safe. So. I do want to thank Scott while he's with us for his assistance in assembling that. And he worked as a team as we always have in pulling that together and getting the word out. So uh, we're hoping that um, all the young people and adults in our community can stay safe and healthy uh, through the Halloween holiday. So it's going to be a little bit of a test for us. And uh, the do's and don'ts will uh, keep them out of harm's way. Uh, Julian, do do we have an intellectual property fee? (laughs) <laughs> did you guys did you guys trademark that thing copyrighted sure it's the copywriter trademark that so, uh... get frank get frank back on um yes thank you for putting that together i think it gave some guidance to to a lot of families who were asking so thank you scott um and for everyone who worked on that and we will see you again soon thank you scott thank Take you scott thanks so much um okay next we have a future fire station advisory committee um, they're going to present recommendations on area locations for placement of a fifth fire station. Um, so we have Trisha Favuli and Michael Duffany, and I believe they're going to make the presentation on behalf of that committee. Um, and I just want to start by thanking all the folks who served on that committee. And I know we appointed you, and then we immediately went into COVID pretty soon thereafter. So um, just you know, trying to undertake this task. Um, in the midst of all of that is certainly challenging. So we really appreciate it. And the floor is yours. Trisha, are you gonna? Um, I was waiting for Mike to jump on. Is okay. he there? Yep, there he is. Mike is gonna take over up. speaking. Okay, so, great. Thank Welcome thank to both you. of you. Uh, Welcome, thank you. Oh, Should sorry. Should we Kim Smith also, Chief Smith? Yes. I, is Kim he Smith on? He was gonna so jump on too. Yep, he well. is here. It looks like they're letting him in now, so. Great, thank you. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Mike Duffany here, uh, co-chair of the fire station committee with Trish. And I want to thank Trish so much for for all that she's done to help coordinate this effort. Julian was part of this and and like to thank the the members of the committee, which we were very fortunate to have 
a group of, of firefighters that, you know, retired firefighters of all different walks and uh, levels, if you will, in the department. So we had tremendous amount of input into the McGrath report. And we have made some recommendations to the Board of Selectmen and in that respect that we have looked at the, the site for the new uh, proposed Hatchville fire station. And we've come up with an area on Sandwich Road that we have recommended. And in doing our due diligence and looking at the different areas and the coverage and so forth, it does jump out at the committee that, uh, and it was very concerning to the committee that, that we need to be careful in creating another red spot. And I know I don't want to get a little ahead of myself because there hasn't been a study done yet when, the, when and if the West Falmouth Fire Station does become closed. But uh, our recommendation would, would be to consider the site for the combined north and west station somewhere between the Thomas Landers Road and the Winslow Road up in the North Falmouth area. Uh, we have not identified specific parcels, although several have come to our attention and we are purposely not identifying specific parcels at, at this time. Um, that said, certainly willing to answer any questions uh, that the board may have of us. Great, so welcome uh, Chief Smith. I know that you were coming in while we were um, it, you know, we're introducing you while we kind of got started. So thanks for being here. Why don't we do this? Um, if we want to open it up to any questions that members of the board have, um, and then might just ask you, um, Trish and Mike, to tell us a little bit about just the process um, for the public to just know sort of what you guys looked at, you know, just in terms of how you kind of came to this um, this conclusion, what you, what uh, information you took in, just so the public who hasn't been following it understands. And, and next steps. Yep. Great. So we we met, you know, publicly for until till the pandemic, you know, shut us down, and then we had a couple of remote uh, Zoom meetings, if you will, to uh, to can, to carry on. We were very close to our deliberations when we actually did need to to go into the Zoom mode. So we had. Uh, spent a lot of a lot of time looking at the report as it pertains to the response times of the existing fire stations that we have, and we found through the report that it appears that that three of the current fire stations are cited in areas that that appear to be correct to the McGrath study, and to the uh, and also to the folks that that have worked in the town and responded to calls and so forth from those stations, being uh, Woods Hole. Main Street and the East Falmouth fire stations. Um, and then of course the Hatchville area has been, you know, has been very underserved, if you will, for, a, you know, since day one, I guess you could say, because the response time to, to the fire ends of Hatchville are still the same today as they were 30 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, minus the new equipment. So, you know, so that said, we, we took a very close look at, at, if we put this, if we recommended a station in, in area X, what does it do to the response times? Um, we studied the report very carefully. And again, because of the, 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 the depth of the committee, we were able to really look at and, and entertain some good dialogue about you know, what it takes to, to get to a, a fire. If it's on, the, on a corner lot, if it's on a straightaway, if it doesn't have quite the right visibility, if it doesn't have the right frontage, Right depth. There's a lot of things that that uh, go into the into a new station as they are being designed today. And uh, so that said, that does uh, really minimize the number of of parcels, if you will, in a developed area that could then be utilized for such a, an endeavor as a as a new station. And and we looked at when we looked at that, what kept jumping out at us was that was again if. The uncertainty of the Northwest uh, situation, and what would happen if we close, you know, one of those stations, and and it does, uh, in, you know, from what we have for information in front of us under the current study, it it does add to response time considerably to to that West Falmouth area. Now that said, we would indulge the selectmen to board to the board to consider having McGrath run, you know, run a scenario based on, on our findings and, and see, I know we had asked that early on if they had any wiggle room in, in their budget to, to look at a proposed location and to tell us with a, you know, with a reconfigured uh, 
station area, you know, what does that do to the to the to the then response to the rest of the community? So so we are basing our report and our recommendations on on the report as it was with the existing stations remaining open. So that said, that has uh, somewhat changed since since then, and we just feel in our, our due diligence process that we we could not not answer this question of, of what next. It's not up to us which station comes first. Thank you very much. Thanks for filling in, Doug Jones. As I understand the report, Mike, you're suggesting this would be a sixth fire station, not a fifth fire station, because that's the recommendation. And did you only look at town parcels, or are you recommending just any spot, whether it's town owned or privately owned? Well, we we are looking at at any lots, which is why I'm not identifying specific parcels to you this evening, because we are looking at at specific lots that are better than you know than others uh, in our you know in our evaluation. Uh, the Sandwich Road is you know it's town owned land. It's not it's a little a little different there. Um, and the I apologize, Doug. The very first part of your question. Six stations or five stations is. So we're looking at a five station model and that again was not part of our charge to, to come up with whether or not we need a, a six station or not. So we did look at, at a five station model. So that said, when, when and if you build the new Hatchville station, one of the other stations in North or West Falmouth, I would expect would need to close in the five station model. And uh, right now, of course, station four is, is the one that is up for closure as it has been on and off. So that's so we looked at it as a five station model, and with that in mind, it's what you know which comes first, the the new the new station or the you know the reconfiguration of four and five and the in the new station, and then the you know while that's being constructed, even the possibility of another station. We we do we are the opinion that the town is going to need two stations in the very near future in order to accommodate the coverage to a new station to go to a five station model. Any other questions from the board? I was hoping you guys would suggest the prioritize of the one new location, whether it's in Hatchville or North and West. Was there a sense from your committee? I know it's our decision ultimately, but just looking for a little guidance on that. Yeah, Trish. Yep. I think that you know initially when we all started, we were all looking at Hatchville being the single station, and the more we read the report and we read the runs, the time factor, um, locations, the red zones, we all were pretty much in agreement that we had to look at another section of town other than just Hatchville. Um, you know, we made our Hatchville vote first. That was what we looked at first. That's where we spent all our time. Once that was done, we moved on with the decision to look further into that Northwest Falmouth Florida, knowing what you're dealing with over in North and West with a likelihood of closing one of those stations. And those two stations have truly aged out after we did our tour, the whole group saw what we were dealing with. Um, which one comes first? I think ultimately that's up to the town manager and the board of selectmen what we do first. Um, either way, you're gonna be shifting a little red someplace. Um, but from what I understand now with the new man, model that we're working with those red zones have changed because we are increasing our response time so that may you know that in another six or eight months may change things once the whole year of study is done on the runs that may change some of the red zones too is the cost the only thing stopping us from doing both at the same time um i believe so i mean initially the funding um was discussed for hatchville and that was looked at you know what do we do do we do two stations at one time do we build identical stations? Do we look at plans that are just straight, just bays and sleeping areas and no meeting room? I think that's something that has to be discussed too. How much are we gonna spend? Do we wanna have Taj Mahal's or do we wanna have nice sturdy fire stations that are serviceable? Um, you know, ultimately it's gonna be what the town budget can stand. Thank you, Trish. Julian? Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I wanna thank uh, co-chairs Trish Favulli and Mike Duffany as well as all members of the committee for their fine work. I was pleased to join them for all but one of the, one of the uh, several meetings that were held. I, I did wanna clarify a couple of things if I may. Um, if uh, the, the board, it's been a little while since the board had a presentation and looked over the McGrath study. When you look at it, you, uh, you see that 
Um, McGrath analyzed the physical condition of all five stations and found the West Falmouth station to be well beyond its useful life. However, the North Falmouth station, McGrath found is still serviceable. So I guess I wanna be really cautious that there were some suggestions at the committee level that both of them were beyond their useful life. That is not what the McGrath study concludes. Uh, you know, as professionals brought in to analyze this, it is on a tight site. Um, however, uh, West Falmouth is beyond its useful life. North Falmouth is not. Um, the other thing is that um, the uh, analysis on based on three total years of actual run data. So we have 36 months as uh, Acting Chief Smith's aware. And by the way, uh, uh, retired Chief uh, Mike Small assisted us as well, which we appreciate greatly. Um, when, when you looked at three years of actual run data, uh, interestingly, the North Falmouth Station, and again, it's right in the report, was found to be surprisingly close to uh, an optimal location. It was not in the same class as Mike Duffany mentioned, uh, East Falmouth headquarters and Woods Hole, which were nearly spot on. But North Falmouth was not far off uh, the general area, um, which is uh, was found by the consultant to be um, a reasonable location to provide service. So based upon uh, that reality that there is a considerable serviceable life remaining in that station, and that its location was not uh, far off. Um, the uh, McGrath recommended uh, strongly a five station model. And uh, the other item that I wanted to share with uh, members of the board, because I know you've discussed this here publicly uh, with the assistance of uh, Acting Chief Smith and our dispatch center, uh, we've been analyzing actual run data. And I know uh, Trish and Mike were referring to that a bit. Actual run data from July 1st uh, through the present time, based upon the new staffing model, which has uh, you know, gone from uh, a minimum of 10 to 14 at start of shift, which is a 40% increase in staffing on, on any, every shift in the town. And since July 1, we've been able to confirm uh, that the response times to the West Falmouth area under this revised staffing plan that the fire command staff has assembled they're averaging a 30 second improvement in response time. And this enhanced response time is occurring even as we are only able to staff West Falmouth about 50% of the shifts. So even with only 50% of the shifts in West Falmouth staffed, our average response time is improved by 30 seconds or more, which is uh, pretty significant and something that we wanna share. I think there's been some publicity about that and that trend uh, continues, but we are gonna continue to monitor it. So a suggestion that necessarily West Falmouth is gonna become, go into a red zone, um, we, we might want to um, withhold final judgment on that until we really see how things uh, unfold because it's turned out that coverage from that North Falmouth station as the consultant determined uh, is providing some, uh, uh, much better coverage in the West Falmouth area than uh, was uh, obvious to many of us going into the study. And Chief Smith uh, may have some comments on that as well. I saw um, Doug Jones, you had your hand up and then um, Chief Smith, if you have anything just about the process in general or any comments you'd like to share, we'd love to hear from you. Go ahead, Doug. Well, I guess I'm a little still concerned about the North Falmouth location I know the report said it was a perfect, or very good location for it, but the report was assuming that West Falmouth existed. If West Falmouth doesn't exist, I do think we need to get coverage a little further south. I guess I would like to push us to look for the ideal and see if there's a way we can do both and push in that direction and then be told, no, nope, we can't do it right now. We need to do one at a time. But I guess that's where my push would be saying we need the Hatchville station and we need a, state, a new station in between North and West. And because at some point we can't do six stations. Once we build the Hatchville, we know we're gonna to have to close West Falmouth. We can't run all six stations. And so uh, instead of saying, well, let's do Hatchville, close West and then have that problem. Why not try to be idealist and say, hey, maybe we can have some cost, uh, savings cost because we're doing two stations. We're using one architect to do two stations. 
We're going for basic barracks that uh, you know are not the Taj Mahal, as Ms. Mavuli said, but we might be able to do both and try to have that be our ideal before we dismiss it. Uh, Doug Brown? I think oh, if we sorry. To... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Doug, and then I'll hear from the chief from Chief okay. Smith. Sorry. I was gonna say that if I think if we can't to do two would be good, but if we can't and we only have to do we can only do one, it seems we're gonna be pushed into doing the Northwest Combination Station first and then the Hatchville. The well, it seems like is, right now we have a North Station that actually is serviceable. Hatchville right. has nothing. Right. But like you said, if we're going to do the Hatchville and close West Falmouth, maybe we're creating another problem. Because it's a long way to give back up to North Falmouth. So, le so let me just have um, uh, Chief Acting Chief Smith um, just weigh in with any thoughts. And I saw Trisha, I saw your hand up, and maybe Mike, you too. So, good evening. Welcome. Good evening. I too wanted to thank the committee uh, for all their hard work. I, you know, I, I listened to many of the comments. There was a lot of uh, good debate going on. I understand the passion that uh, some brought to the committee and, and, it, and you know, I, I was glad to hear that. And it brings about these ongoing discussions that's necessary to look at our infrastructure uh, in the town as far as the fire department's concerned. Um, I believe that the McGrath study has quite a bit of information for a, a lot to take in. It's, it's a very extensive report and everything that Trish and Mike were talking about tonight with regards to the central location that the McGrath study pointed to looks at the Northeast section of, of, of town. And, and, I, and I also appreciate the fact that they're looking at the, the Northwest area for future consideration. You know, the, the study gave a, quite a bit of information about each of the stations and the limitations that we have, but with the support of the selectmen and the town manager, with our recent uh, increase in personnel as of July 1st and our uh, manning uh, throughout the town, our resource deployment has greatly helped improving these areas that were problematic for us, and specifically the central area and the east area. But as Trish and Mike understand and it was discussed North Falmouth also encompasses the third busiest area so trying to weigh that section of town by looking at this central station is it's very important and I think that the study does just that for us and um, gave a lot of different scenarios so I think we're headed in the right direction I'm glad the discussion's going on and I think that we're continuing to see a lot of improvements Hopefully we'll continue to have more personnel. And in the interim, even though we're having this discussion tonight and once there's a decision made, the disposition of the West Falmouth stations ongoing. So it's not gonna happen overnight. And we're still, as our manning increases, we'll be able to provide coverage in that area as our staffing continues. Obviously right now, everybody's been made aware that you know we have the issues with civil service and trying to get all the personnel. So until a new station's been been settled on and actually getting built, we're still going to be operating that station and, and keeping it, you know, going and responding to that one particular area. And also the West Falmouth station augments other areas, just as all the other stations. So um, I just wanted to point that out. And I just thank everybody for, you know, your ongoing support of our department. Thank you. And and I know you alluded to this, Chief, but can you just tell us where we're at with the additional eight firefighters from the prop two and a half? Can you just, I, I know we've talked about the challenges, but just for the public to understand where that is. Sure. So since uh, probably about August, we put in for a request for additional personnel to fill the retirements and resignations that uh, provided, that had these vacancies within our department. We've since been able to fill those vacancies. So we have um, given uh, notice to six of the applicants regarding uh, uh, you know, employment in the town and all six have accepted the job. They've gone through all the testing processes and at least five will be attending the fire academy in December. And we have one that has already attended the fire academy. So we're gonna start him next week. 
with regards to the eight for the override and the additional two after the January uh, date, we're still having some limitations with civil service because of the COVID and the pandemic. The recent spike has has brought um, you know a, a delay again, but civil service has provided us an update. And what they're doing is part of the civil service testing process, besides the written part, is a physical agility exam. It's called an LPAT. It's the entry level physical agility test. They've been conducting those right along because the test site that the state uses is owned by the state. So they can regulate um, and um, move people in and out based on their criteria. So they've already got over 1,900 applicants that have gone through this process. So civil services advise us that they're hopeful that in November, they're gonna to start to start testing these applicants for the on the written side and waves, and they're gonna to start to get this going so that eventually they'll be able to get everybody through the, the testing process to establish a, a list. So the current list that is available to us is a statewide list. We've requested one and we're hoping that it's gonna be here very shortly. We just had to finish the process of getting these others through and um, we're gonna try and get additional applicants in, you know, in, the, you know, in the foreseeable future. Thank you. Uh, Nancy. So I have a quick question. Um, I think what I heard you say, Mr. Suso, is that the response times have improved by 30 seconds. An average Overall? of 30 seconds, yeah. Okay, average. so what are the response times to incidents in Hatchville? Are they the same, improved by 30 seconds? Can Overall? On that? Uh, great question. Uh, yeah, that is a good question. We've been concentrating on these other areas, but you know, right now Hatchville is considered within the East Falmouth area. So I would say that depending on the the distance from the station, for instance, either the north section will, will encompass part of that uh, northeast area or the closer you get to say the, um, the fairgrounds, that might be the east station. So our response times from both those stations could be a little longer. However, because in the east Falmouth station we have that additional manning, we can get our uh, personnel on the road sooner. So that's where the improvements are in our response times. So I, I couldn't give you a definitive time, but uh, it is improving you know, for uh, any areas that we're responding to from the east. Okay, so, so do you track, when you say that, that we've improved by 30 seconds overall, are you tracking who is responding? Do we know who is responding where? Is that yeah. tracked as well? Yes. In, yes. In dispatch, they follow the okay. uh, the apparatus to the particular locations and track it in that vein. So I just think it's curious that the data and and please correct me if I'm wrong that the data is telling you that we have improved response times overall by thirty seconds, um, operating one, two, three, four point five stations. Is that correct? Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. Thank you. Good. So, Chief Smith, if we were going to build the Hatchville station first, and we've got everything else in play, how many more people will we need to supplement our staffing to operate that station? And another part of that question is, once the Hatchville station is built, what size of a staff do you anticipate being there if it were to be built first? And it's a three part, if I could. If we were to build the Hatchville station first, maybe it's a small satellite station with two trucks, four guys, I don't know what it would be, but would that take some of the pressure off of East Falmouth? And if so, could we then maybe shift somebody from East Falmouth over to West Falmouth and operate five and a half stations, sort of, so to speak? Well, you know, without having the, you know, again, on a daily basis, our staffing changes. We're hopeful that by the time we get done with this hiring process, we're going to have 19 
on two shifts and, and 18 personnel on two other shifts. But again, our staffing levels vary day, day to day. So at the beginning of the day right now, we are looking at a 14 man minimum and we don't go out of the station with you know less than two personnel. We have the four personnel in East Falmouth Station and six at headquarters. Shifting people around um, may uh, help in one, you know, one particular station, but if we don't have four personnel in that particular station, then generally three have to go out. So that station becomes unmanned. So our, our goal would be if we have you know, an area that we're trying to uh, bolster, then we have four personnel in that station. So at, if I was to say that we might have a problem on a particular day because we might have people out or vacancies that are not giving us that optimum level of personnel. But I think as we go along, certainly additional personnel would, would help to, you know, to improve the staffing in all these stations so that we did have extra personnel. Uh, and, you know, and moving anybody over to West Falmouth again, in, in the interim before this new station is built, we're hopeful that as we continue to get more personnel, we'll be able to staff uh, West Falmouth. And that's when we have 16 personnel on duty. So we're, you know, again, it's just going to be a, a, an ongoing, uh, you know, assessment of, of, of our personnel and applying that resource deployment across the town to best serve the areas. As we know, Central and East are the, are the busy area. And this new station is based on that, um, that review of the Northeast area, and they would be augmenting those two busiest stations and, and including the North. Thank you. Any other questions for any of our guests? Um, so I know we oh, go ahead, Julian, and then I'm going to just repeat the question that Sam had because I think we lost him. But go ahead, Julian. Yeah, Madam Chair, I was just going to mention uh, just responding to a, a few of the comments from members of the board. Um, nothing would prevent the board, if you would so determine, um, from uh, directing the town manager to move forward and attempting to acquire two different parcels of land. Uh, to me, um, the, the biggest impediment to constructing a station now or in the future is having a parcel of land in the, in the most appropriate location, as opposed to wherever the town happens to maybe own property. Uh, because when you build a station in the wrong place, uh, you pay for it through the life of the station. So uh, that's part of the analysis here that the, uh, uh, Mike and Tricia and the committee uh, so helpfully uh, uh, encountered and, and undertook. Um, so nothing would prevent, for instance, uh, the board, if you so chose, from asking that uh, I make every effort to acquire an appropriate parcel that I'd come back to you uh, with, of course, and ultimately to town meeting in each of these areas, uh, but only construct a single station at this time, as we had represented was the town's initial intent and is within our uh, current financial plan to do. And then when, um, say, the North Falmouth station uh, reaches the end of its useful life, you would have a parcel uh, readily available on which to construct a station that's based upon actual runs and uh, would, would properly serve the public. So I just tossed that out as something to keep in mind uh, for the board. Thank you. Any uh Comments, comments, or thoughts on that particular? Um, well, certainly suggestion. that is that is the objective of this committee is to search for a piece of land. So yes, if we've identified a place, we should acquire the land. I agree. Um, and so to Sam's point, and it's connected to this, is sort of what are you know next steps? Where do we go from this particular report as we go forward? Um, and I think it speaks directly to, you know, what is the directive from this board um, to a town manager? Is there, you know, is there other information that we're asking this particular committee to look at? Um, what is the pleasure or thought of this board as it speaks to those, uh, those issues? Go ahead, Doug Brown. Well, so the committee's identified that the town owned parcel on Sandwich Road would certainly be adequate and good quality for a fire station. So that one we're all set. So I would direct the town manager to go to the site that's recommended in the North Falmouth area 
and look into acquiring the property there so we're ready for planning. Any comment on that from the rest of the board? Okay. Is that, yep, Mr. Sousa? Madam Chair, I just wanted to interject some caution that the uh, committee's identified a couple sites on Sandwich Road mm -hmm. and actually had looked at more than that. So I would just um, encourage the board to uh, be willing to be flexible there mm -hmm. um, because uh, one of the options would involve utilizing, potentially utilizing land which has been set aside for recreation purposes uh, for, in this case, another use. So um, having a little bit of flexibility in terms of what the board um, ultimately uh, considers and allowing me to bring back, uh, you know, maybe more than one option to the board uh, would potentially be most helpful. Okay. Any further, if any further discussion from the board, anything else from Mike or Trish or Acting Chief Smith? Yes, Trish. Just one thing. I of interest that came out of this committee was 35 years ago, there was a committee to study the Hatchville station. They made a recommendation 35 years ago and we're still sitting here talking about it. Um, so I think I, for one, full disclosure, I'm living in Hatchville. And when I, started, <laughs> when I started reading that McGrath study, I went, oh my goodness, that's pretty yeah. scary. You know, we have these great firefighters, but if they can't get there timely, they can't save your life. Flip side, the West Elmwood people are saying the same thing. It's a tough decision, but you know we have identified several pieces on Sandwich Road, and they all belong to the town. So, as Doug says, we've already narrowed that down. So we should move on to the next location. Um, and if we can find a town parcel on that North Falmouth West Falmouth Highway area, there are a couple. Um, we may may luck out and get two pieces of property that we already own, and then we're only looking at money for the station. Great. So I guess, um, do you need a vote from us, Julian, or you just need some direction that this board is, um, you know, really hoping that you can follow up on that dual um, approach about looking in sort of both of the areas and coming back to us with some uh, potential proposals for land acquisition and or land use um, in those two general areas that this committee has uh, identified. Excuse me. Well, Ma Madam Chair, if it would be the board's desire to act tonight, um, I would welcome um, direction from the board to allow me to proceed to look at uh, potential uh, parcels in these two identified areas. Uh, but I would also, uh, in addition to that, I would ask the board to either tonight or uh, in a uh, meeting in the very near future to be uh, targeting uh, one of these areas for future fire station construction, because I would uh, very much welcome uh, taking full advantage of the, uh, the momentum that we, which we have built up that uh, is to uh, take a uh, station that's beyond its useful life and replace it with a state-of-the-art station uh, that uh, we've represented the public and also with the override on firefighters that that would be our intention. So. We have continued, I just want to underscore, we've been continuing exactly as this board had laid out in terms of how we've proceeded since uh, uh, very early in this calendar year. And that would be the next step uh, is to identify how you'd like to proceed because if that is the desire of the board, I'd very much like to be uh, working diligently on this and bringing back some action, something for you to act upon, potentially for springtime meeting. Right. Yeah, I think to just to Trisha's point, um, there have been other times in the history of the town where there's been some momentum, some studies done, and we haven't gotten past that, you know, that that hump to make it a reality. Um, and so this board um, has pushed really hard since last year, both in creating this committee because we really wanted a lot of eyes and expertise and different opinions to weigh in on this, and then obviously in pushing for the staffing with the prop two and a half. Um, and so, um, Julian, I think the, the, you know, Julian is looking from this board um, for some specific direction um, to go forward and to look practically at some uh, land acquisition and or use. So do we have, are we, uh, do we have that for Julian? I don't want to speak for the board. So what's the board's pleasure? I move that we authorize the 
chair the uh, town manager to seek out these parcels as recommended by the fire station search committee okay. uh sam you're muted i see you saying something patterson second okay i have a motion and a second any further discussion i think mr suso you've heard sort of from the board um our uh, desire in terms of what we'll be looking for in the coming weeks from you, um, as you noted with that with that eye towards town April town meeting. Um, so I have a motion and a second. All those in favor by roll call, please. Taylor, you're muted, Nancy. Aye. Taylor, aye. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Jones. Jones, aye. Brown. Brown, aye. Patterson. Patterson, aye. English Braga, aye. Great. Thank you, everyone, for your hard work. We really appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much. Ask for not only the information about the, build, the location, but also about moving forward with plans. And so we've, we've given him the direction on the property. How do we feel about plans? I guess I'm still would love to, to investigate the possibility of moving forward. Now, could we do both? I know we've said we're moving forward with one, but to, I'd rather ask the question and be told, Nope, it just is not within our means to do at this point. We need to do one at a time. And I'd be happy to then move out, move after one. But <sighs> I would still love to ask Jennifer to throw the numbers out there and see what could happen. Okay, with the pleasure, uh, with the pleasure, would the board like to um, go forward without further directive? Sam? Uh, well, I, I will defer to Julian, but it seems like we would have to be seeking out an architect to provide us with the kind of information that we would need. So that could be part of that same motion. Is uh, Nancy and Doug Brown, are, what are your thoughts about that particular suggestion? Then I'll come to you, Julian. Well, I think we need to consult a little bit. We're just gonna quickly spend $10 million or so, and we don't even really know the price. So it's a little bit of a an impact to the budget. So we should consult with Jen uh, Mullen before we, make a big decision like that shouldn't we yeah i don't think doug jones is i don't think doug jones is suggesting we make the decision i think he's saying can we uh direct julian to work with jennifer work with um you know whomever is appropriate to get maybe some estimates or what that might look like i think that's what okay. doug doug is that am i misrepresenting what you're saying not at all you're right on the money okay, okay. that sounds good i, I okay. agree with that and okay. I'm expecting the answer is going to be we just there's no way we can do both, but I just think it makes sense to ask the question. Be told, look, just do one at a time. That's what the capital budget for the next ten years or twenty years can support. But I still I think the best would be able, the best thing we could do is to do both of them if there's any way we could swing it. We can get a buy one get one half off deal. They're all out there. Um, so so Julian, do you under so in other words, we're just looking for some way in and we understand it's a, it's very um sort of general and there's a lot of speculation but um obviously uh we have a great finance department we have a lot of you know folks who have a really good eye about what it takes to build a municipal facility um so just to you know get some um some sort of cost analysis if possible we're as rough as it is we're certainly happy to do that um yeah, i just don't want to underscore your your financial plan which you've adopted shows construction of a single station within the, uh, you know, the, the budgeted funds so that the, or, you know, our tax burden does not increase over that time. So we would have to uh, change our approach in that regard and which we can certainly do. We'll bring information back to the board. Also keep in mind that your next uh, major wastewater initiative is, has been uh, fairly carefully planned as to timing as well, which is why I suggested that at a minimum you might want to consider um, setting land aside uh, and building a second station as time and resources um, uh, allow. Because keep in mind that both of these stations are gonna require a debt exclusion mm -hmm. of a significant amount of funds. We've been talking about that with voters when we proceeded with the override for the eight additional firefighters. Uh, but keep in mind, you're gonna need an additional permanent override for even more firefighters and for more equipment. Um, 
if uh, you, you're going to take that take that next step. So, um, yeah, there are a lot of in financial uh, issues to be uh, dealt with, and I'll be happy to work with Jennifer on that and get back to the board. In the meantime, what I'm hearing is that I have a green light to be looking at the land issues. Also, just a reminder that uh, and I've been involved in a couple areas where we've had fire station construction, the design and uh, really the the, uh, the implementation of new fire stations uh, is significantly impacted by the parcel of land that they are appear on. So it isn't, uh, there isn't like one vanilla design that works uh, ideally in every case. So we gotta be a little careful about that. And uh, um, you know, it is, it is difficult to, in my experience to achieve major cost savings uh, by um, doing uh, several at once, uh, but we certainly are happy to look at it and we'll bring, bring back the numbers. And I appreciate the board's sincerity and wanting to uh, uh, have no stone unturned to uh, proceed in a positive way overall in the community. So thank you for that public safety uh, commitment. Great, thank you. Thanks again to the committee. Thank you, Acting thank you. Chief Smith. Uh, we really appreciate it. So let's continue this discussion um, as we go forward to hopefully not have the discussion 35 years from now, Trish, when we're still Thank in Nashville. Thank, Thank you, you all. Do you, do you need a vote to have you proceed to with a building plan for at least one the Springtown meeting? I would certainly I would certainly welcome that if that would be uh, the board's willingness. I, I would very much like to be able to have the opportunity to bring something to you in time for Springtown meeting, potentially the spring ballot as well. I just think I just think our agenda really says one, you know, really says presentation, recommendations. It doesn't say a vote. I just think, you know, we can put it on a very upcoming meeting, but just to really be um, sort of tried and true with keeping up with our agenda being uh, appropriately noticed. Okay. Um, thanks. Okay. Next. Thank you all. Thank you guys. Next, we have a status report. Oh, thank you. Status report update um, discussion on wind turbines. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Chair. Are you walking us in. through this? Yeah, we want to bring in uh, Jennifer Mullen and great. And also, uh, Frank is back with us, and also Chris Morog. Yep. who is a uh, right. um, outside counsel who's assisting us on this and want to make sure that uh, all three are, are with us. Okay. Uh, yeah, just by way of background, uh, Madam Chair. Right. Um, Welcome. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, as, as the board will recall, we, we have a long history with the Falmouth wind turbines, including a recent uh, direction uh, to me, after a study by Weston and Sampson, and we really wanted to go through a little bit of the uh, historical background and sequence for uh, what has brought us to this point. And uh, with the able assistance of Finance Director Jennifer Mullen, Jennifer has a uh, can screen share on some information. Then we'll follow up with comments uh, from uh, from those of us here as well, including uh, Attorney Chris Morag. Jennifer, do you want to uh, go ahead and proceed? Sure, thank you. Um, Thomas Cox has the, because um, he has the screen sharing capability. So here we are, <laughs> thank you. It's nice to see everybody this evening. So I just wanted to um, lay, the ground, lay the groundwork of where we are right now and just kind of go, go back um, a couple years. I won't go back the whole, you know, 10 years. I'm just gonna go back a couple years. So um, in May of 2018, the build, building commissioner requested a plan be submitted for the disposition of wind one. Um, the town manager responded stating that the town was pursuing several alternatives working with an engineering firm. And at that point we had under contract Weston and Sampson and we, and we contracted with them and we decided to um, come up with a plan to perform an analysis. If you remember, we came in front of the board with this. We came up, we had an analysis done if we were going to move the turbines on the same parcel at the wastewater treatment plant, but away from the neighbors. And was there really an appetite for that? 
Um, and then at that time, the select board voted not to operate the turbines in the town of Falmouth and to explore other disposition alternatives, such as operating them outside of the town. And that started us on another path. So we were trying to think, working with Weston and Samson, we were looking at the best way to really procure this. Um, this hadn't been done before. So we continued to work with them on the feasibility of relocating the turbines to a location outside of the town of Falmouth. Um, we met on multiple um, occasions. One of, another um, thing that we did is we met on multiple occasions with JBCC, the Joint Base Cape Cod, regarding potentially hosting the two turbines on their land. Um, through those meetings, there would have been a requirement for a significant upfront cost to complete a capital project on the base. Plus, we had several um, procurement issues. We would have um, had a hurdle with that as well, and a lot of approval processes. And then in April 2019, the town requested letters of interest for the operation of the wind turbines, and responses were modest. So then we wanted to gauge the, you know, see if there was any interest out there, you know, if we could move them um, to dispose of them. Excuse me one second. Um, so we wanted to, you know, gauge and see what the letters of interest were, and they were modest at the time. And the majority of the responses, um, they had interests were kind of all over the place. They had interest in maybe repurposing, dismantling, and purchasing the turbines. We also received one interest from consultants to broker a deal to host the turbines outside of the town to see, you know, where we could put them. Um, so working with Weston and Sampson, what we decided is we, because it is a difficult procurement processes, process, you have several different um, mass general laws governing, you know, the um, dismantling of an asset, um, if it's a vertical construction, horizontal construction. And so at that time, we, um, we, assembled an RFQ to procure it as an energy efficient project to be bid under Mass General Laws 25A. And if we did this, we did the same thing with ESCO, if you remember with the ESCO project several years ago, we would be able to do maybe one RFQ, get somebody on board um, and really do a full procurement um, for an energy efficient project. And we had, so we worked with the state and through several months of review and deliberation with the Mass Department of Energy Resources, they ultimately decided that this was not a um, Chapter 25A procurement. And that kind of brought us back, um, back to the starting board. Um, so, Do you mind elaborating on that a little bit? Excuse me? Could you mind elaborating a little bit on that, please? Sure. Um, so chapter 25, Mass General Law chapter 25A is, um, well, let me back up. If you remember when we procured the um, energy management, the ESCO project, where we did a lot of um, switching out of the HVACs and a lot of buildings, what right. that chapter allows us to do is to do one procurement, and it's really like a bid build. Um, it's not a bid build. A, a design bid bill. It's a design bill, it's not a design bid bill. So you 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 bid it once, you don't have to bid it twice. So you can have the engineer on board and then the engineer procures it and has subcontractors with other um, you know contractors that can bring them on board and then you can just get it done through one procurement. And what we did is when we did that procurement, we did it through train. So since this had never been done before with the wind turbines and you know the um, issues that we faced, we figured let's try to see if we can procure it under one bidding process and bring somebody on board that could, you know, maybe help us with an energy efficient project for the whole deal of, you know, where could we move them to, taking them down and move it. It was pretty ambitious when I think about it, but as we worked through the different issues of procurement through the state. On, under a 25A, um, they said that we wouldn't be able to do it. And let me um, also mention that when you do bid um, an energy efficient project under 25A, you have to have state approval and they have to approve the contract. So you're working with them every step of the way in the bid process, where when we bid out a 
you know, um, a renovation or if we're procuring goods and services, we don't have to involve the state. We just have a bidding process that we have to go through. But under 25A, we have to um, have state approval to do that. Does that answer your question, Doug? Yeah, that's good. Okay, thank you. So um, after a couple months, or uh, it was longer than that, they said that wouldn't be able to um, happen under that general law. So we went back to Weston and Sampson and looked at the RFQ and um, we just uh, we just knew we needed additional help. So we actually brought um, Chris Morag on board, who's with us this evening. And um, let me just, I have, it's, the, what's on my screen is hard for me to read. So I'm reading from over here. So just, you know, just bear with me for a second as I try to do a presentation on Zoom. Um, all right. So, pardon me, Je Jennifer. You uh, you didn't touch on the fact that, as as you know, we took uh, a request to town meeting for two and a half million dollars for uh, disposition of the uh, dismantling and disposition, which was approved. That was on the uh, last, the beginning of the last bullet point. Yep, you're right. I have it right here. Um, I think um, I I'm a little bit behind on what was on the screen, so I apologize. And Not as I got off on my I don't usually somewhat stick to the bullet points. Um, so we did, as Julian said, we did, um, you know, we, we received and requested approval of two and a half million at the November 2019 town meeting to um, for the disposition of the wind turbines. And that's when we just, you know, went into the 20, the RFQ as an energy efficient project. We knew we had some money appropriated. And that's after several months of review, we weren't able to do that. And what we were realizing too, is if we were to move the um, turbines onto another piece of property outside of the town of Falmouth, we would need significant upfront costs. The two and a half million was really to dismantle and store. If we were to move them, that would be highly expensive. If we were putting them on another piece of property, how would we get future revenue? There would have to be another piece of property that would be um, serviced by Eversource getting into the grid. And then another um, nuance that we find is that, you know, when you do receive credits from Eversource, a lot of times you get a credit on the bill, you do not get a check. And for us, for, for us we would need the revenue from the future revenue from you know, running the turbines. Right now they're over 10 years old with an expectant life cycle of 20 years. Um, and due to the current status of the turbines, further steps to permit some combination of the sale, lease, design, dismantling, transportation, and possible erection of the turbines raise many procurement issues that we understand have no precedent and never been addressed in the state of Massachusetts. So to be able to do all of that with the wind turbines is, is a difficult task just to do it on under regular mass general law. And like I said, that's why at that time we contacted attorney Mora for further consultation and wanted to bring you, you know, just let you all know for the last couple of years, we've met several times, um, have done a lot of work on this. Um, trying to come up with solutions. And um, that kind of brings us here this evening to um, let you know where, where we're at and to try to get some direction for the future. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so Julian, do you, are, are we gonna have um, Attorney Morag weigh in and sort yes. of let us know where we are? That'd be great. Great, yes. welcome. I think you're muted. Chris. I think you're still muted, Chris. There we go. Perfect. Thanks. <laughs> Good evening, all. Um, as you know, you own these uh, these two turbines. They ceased operating, although they're receiving some ongoing maintenance. Uh, a big thing to consider is what myself and my firm we do a lot of energy work as well. That the turbines, although they haven't been used that much, they're no longer state of the art technology, both the, both in the turbines themselves and also the connections that they have into the grid, those things change on a uh, fairly regular basis. And uh, one thing that I'm sure you're all aware of as well is that at least for the second turbine known as Win 2, the town received a principal forgiveness loan from the Massachusetts Clean Water Trust. And that a condition of that loan was that they needed to be operated or that particular one needed to be operated for an extended period of time. And if so, much if not all of the loan will be forgiven. 
So as I understand it, due to the brief operating time of WIN2, there remains a significant balance on the loan. So it's a, uh, it's a complex situation, if you will, uh, because we, uh, you know, the town needs to deal with the Clean Water Trust in trying to come to some amicable resolution and move forward, as well as maximizing their value of these turbines, which currently exist on town land. Um, so as Jennifer said, I know that the town has uh, explored a, a variety of ways with consultants to try to deal with this. I was recently brought in to take a look at this. And uh, under my review, because uh, the town was not able uh, to get the approval of the state to do a 25A procurement, that it really presents a myriad of procurement and disposal issues and legal issues to try to move these turbines to some other parcel of land. And also at the same time, um, you know, have some agreement for an amicable uh, you know, go forward plan with the Clean Water Trust. So what I think probably needs to happen is to have a discussion with the Clean Water Trust about various options and things to be able to do what would satisfy them and try to uh, come up with some acceptable resolution for the town and the Clean Water Trust. And then it's very likely that special legislation um, will be needed to have more of a one-stop shopping for whatever that combination of intended outcome is that is acceptable to the town and the Massachusetts Clean Water Trust because as Jennifer alluded to, you've got uh, a public structure that needs to be dismantled. Um, it needs to be uh, designed to be dismantled properly. And then you need to dispose of what is essentially uh, personal property of the town through uh, another type of procurement uh, vehicle, if you will. And then if someone were to want to move those to some other area, you know, once again, there's design for where they're ever, where they're going to go. It's all the site work. It's all the permitting. It's the interface with the grid and then the construction contract. And I just don't know if there's the value in those turbines to go through all that with all those upfront costs. So it would make sense to me to have a, um, a discussion with the Massachusetts Clean Water Trust once again, and then come up with a plan moving forward and then try to get special legislation to effectuate whatever is acceptable to both parties. Thank you. Um, let me just ask, I see Doug Jones. Let me just ask Frank, is there anything that we need to hear from you? And then we'll kind of open it up to questions across the, the board. Uh, no, but I think that uh, both Jennifer and Chris and Julian have alluded to the real problem we're facing here. We have a unique situation. All of the, all of the Massachusetts general laws provide for putting these things up. Uh, there's no provision in the law that really accommodates us for moving them or taking them down, other than multiple layers of procurement processes, each of which costs a significant amount of money and require us to engage professionals and design engineers and contractors and so on and so forth. So when Chris is saying that once we determine what the Clean Water Trust will accept, it only makes sense to see if the state legislature will give us a special act that will allow us to go to procurement one time, acquire all of the skills necessary to dispose of these turbines and do it once and forever. Really the only way we see out now, thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, all right, let me open it up. I saw Doug Jones. <clears throat> I remain extremely frustrated that the state on one hand is gonna say we have to pay back the three and a half million dollars. And on the other hand saying, but we're not gonna help you. If the state agencies uh, are not communicating with each other or uh, are speaking two sides of their face at the same time. I understand they're different state organizations, but the fact that the DOER isn't willing to allow us to use the 25A procurement uh, is just unbelievable. And something that I actually think we could have used a little bit more publicity and public pressure on them. I was not aware that they were considering this or that they were saying no. And this is where I think maybe our state legislatures and representatives could actually apply some pressure. Um, they've tied our hands and given us no option whatsoever. Can you- Go can ahead, you, Doug. Can you tell us what the reason was for saying no? Um, 
uh, we went back and forth. They just didn't see this as an energy efficient project under the guidelines of the OER. They were, they, um, she read through it. Um, they had some changeover in staff while they were reviewing it. Um, Julie and I met with them actually when we were at the MMA conference to discuss it. But they just, you know, keep in mind that um, that this isn't something that has ever been done before. Right, they're selling us a bill of goods though. The state's so, the one who dumped us these, dumped these turbines on us. They set us all up for this. And the fact that they're now not willing to help us get out of it. Yes, it's the first time to happen, but we're the ones willing to step forward and being a community to support it and be at the forefront of this. And now we're getting screwed over by the state again. It's just completely infuriating that this is what they're doing. And um, there's a way that we could, they could help us by agreeing to it. Yes, it would be groundbreaking, but somebody's got to do it. And on all, you know, and I know you're frustrated and I'm, I'm the messenger, but I just want to say that I don't think they look, you know, DOER is just a part of government that we've never dealt with before with, since I've been here for the wind turbines. I've dealt with the trust, I've dealt with um, Mass Clean Energy Center and all those other factions of state government with, with what's been going on. DOER wasn't privy. I think to you know the overall issue of the wind turbines, although we did try to discuss it with them. Um, and I just, you know, I just want to say that there was just so many layers here they didn't feel that it, it was. Can, can I ask Chris and Frank a question? Is there any mechanism, not that we, you know, want to drag things out or make them more um, litigious or confrontational, but is there some mechanism to review this particular decision that they have? Um, I, I understand it's novel what we're asking, but um, it, you know, it is, there are you know, so many sort of extenuating facts that we don't, we don't need to repeat, but we all know that Doug Jones is alluding to, um, you know, and particularly in this economic environment that we're in, they're really you know, hammering a, an economic Blow um, to our community in requiring this. Is there some mechanism to address this? Uh, I will respond. Uh, I'm not aware of a specific mechanism. Um, I also think that it would make sense to try to involve the Massachusetts Clean Water Trust as well, if there were any suggestion to try to go back to DOER on this to see what is acceptable to them because it's gotta be a multifaceted approval. I would think before you'd wanna spend any time or money moving forward with any type of process that affects these turbines before the town spends in, uh, any further money or is subject to any encumbrance for any additional amounts or liabilities. Uh, I don't know if it makes sense to try to put a new proposal together at this point or not. I'll defer to Jennifer and Julian and Frank on that because I wasn't involved in the earlier process. However, I don't believe there was any, if you will, appeal from mm -hmm. the prior failure uh, to agree that this project set, you know, was within those parameters. Okay. I'm Frank. gonna jump in for oh, one Sorry. Second. Yeah, go ahead, Jennifer, and then Frank. Yeah. Okay. Um, to have DOER approve this or to go back to them and say, okay, we're gonna approve this as an energy efficient project. Correct me if I'm wrong, Chris or Frank. But basically what we would be telling them is that we're actually gonna move these turbines to some other parcel of land outside of Falmouth to have them operate again. And from everything that we've been looking at and discussing that to, to be able, it, that's significant more money than we have appropriated. And there's significant risk to do that especially trying to find a grid to put them in and somebody to host them. And that's really looking at the appetite of how much more money do you really want to appropriate for the wind turbines with everything else that we've been looking at. So I just mentioned that with 25A, that means that we've made a decision that we definitely want to move these turbines to some other parcel of land other than Falmouth. But if we were to dispose of them and have an agreement with the trust and use the money that we already have appropriated, then it would not be a 25A project because it's not an efficient, an energy efficient project. We're not running them. And guess, remember, uh, these turbines are 10 years old. So I just I wanted to throw that out there. I thought that's what we were trying to do. 
I thought our whole plan was to try to move them someplace else and run them. And that's what we agreed on. Right. We, we, can continue, we can continue to do that. I'm just, I'm just mentioning the fact that if we do move these turbines to another parcel of land, it's just going to be significant money to, to move them. They're very large and they're older and there is risk and to get money back. I mean, as we went through this process the last year or two with Weston and Samson, one of the issues we found is that if you do hook these up to a grid on another parcel of land outside of Falmouth, how do we get a revenue sharing agreement? We might not be able to get revenue from Eversource. They could probably say, you know what, we'll give you some sort of credit on the bill. Well, what we really want is money and we need that loan forgiven. So these are the little nuances that came up in the last you know, year or two. What's the significant cost up front? What money, what, give me a figure. Um, well, to move the turbines, this would be the cost that we had the two and a half million was to dismantle them and store them but if we were going to move them and then put them back up you probably took talking maybe i mean it would be more millions i would say two three million dollars so why could then you have to point? bring them back you have to put them back up again you think it'd be more than two and a half million to take them down and put them back up even though it only cost 10 million to buy them and do the whole thing yes yes absolutely yeah. If that's, we could that, use the, we had, couldn't we use the 2.5 that we procured for doing this? And then even if we didn't get revenue, we wouldn't owe 3.5 million because the Clean Water Act could be certainly convinced they are running someplace. What they want to do is they want energy produced. And if these things run energy someplace, if we don't get the revenue, as long as we don't have to pay three and a half million dollars, we're better off. We are uh... Yeah, yeah, you make an excellent point, uh, Select Person Jones. We are hoping that we can sit down with the Clean Water Trust and in the, given the good faith efforts by the town, for instance, town meeting as noted uh, within the recent past, appropriating two and a half million dollars to be prepared for disposition if we don't come up with some reasonable options that we can perhaps come up with an acceptable resolution and be relieved of some or all of that remaining debt. Uh, the, the problem is a, a massive risk management exercise. If we, if we are successful in securing a third party site, if difficulties arise akin to what we experienced here, we could spend five to $10 million additional. And some of those numbers are codified in Weston and Sampson study that they prepared for us, we could spend that kind of money and still not be able to turn the turbines on. And then uh, the Clean Water Trust can say, well, you still didn't achieve the end, so you still owe us money. Do you so think we, that if we don't, if we stop now, we can convince the Clean Water Trust not to make us pay it back, but we go through this, this extraordinary efforts to run them again, they will make us pay it back. I'm afraid that doesn't make a lot of sense. If Right now, we actually have a strong enough argument to convince them that we shouldn't have to pay it back. If we move them and try to run them someplace else and put all that money into it, I don't understand how they wouldn't be even more convinced we don't have to pay it back. It's, cer it's certainly an argument that we're prepared to make to them. If the board uh, wants to authorize us to sit with them uh, further and begin to explore these possibilities, I guess the concern, Doug, is that uh, we could ask for an appropriation of five to $10 million beyond the two and a half we already have with no uh, guarantee or no uh, significant, uh, the, the, the odds are still, are still not in our favor is the concern we have, that we could invest those dollars as the town has in the past without any guarantee that we're gonna be relieved not only of that debt burden, but not be able to show any revenues from operation of the turbines as well. So it's so the only uh, question we could ask Clean Water Trust is that if we try to move them and get them running someplace else, would they forgive us? And this is maybe what the attorney is suggesting. But I, I guess I don't remember the five to ten dollar million dollar figure that Samson was saying to move them. I just am stunned that it would cost ten million dollars, which is what it cost us to 
buy them and put them up the first place to take them down and move them. My recollection, um, Doug, and we'll double check this uh, and get back and confirm, was that merely to move them on the town's wastewater site and engage in all the construction and permitting to move them further from residential locations, which is what Weston and Sampson analyzed, would have would require uh, several million dollars in addition to the two and a half. That's my uh, memory. We'll double check that. Uh, it's just the, the uh, construction on a massive, massive scale and uh, the, the moving of very heavy and uh, awkward elements on a massive, massive scale as well. So we'll I, I guess I would be, you know, I think that we have, I know Sue Moran and I met years ago and we, we you were there, Julianne, Jennifer, I believe you were there. We met with the Secretary of Energy for the state of Massachusetts. Um, we had many conversations, some of our legislative representatives assisted, and there was some discussion about some potential forgiveness around uh, those monies owed, correct? We, we did raise that issue in the past. The uh, Clean Water Trust has a definite uh, membership that is statutory, and the, uh, uh, the state treasurer, uh, Treasurer's office has a considerable impact on decisions made there. Um, and those are the individuals with whom we would potentially sit down and uh, have a follow up discussion. So, um, you know, I think that our state treasurer, who is um, actually very much part of the community here on Cape Cod and who has a long standing connection, I think she um, and the folks that work with her, you know, could be very sympathetic if we really put together the fact that this financial burden on this community and what it is going to do to our community and our further commitment that we have made to green energy and the fact that every dollar we continue to pour into this lost cause of these turbines is a dollar we can't spend on green energy, renewable energy as we go forward. I mean, we have absolutely nothing to lose in being the strongest advocates we can for the community. Because at this point, these are huge burdens just hanging around the neck of every taxpayer in this community. And, and I understand we've tried multiple avenues to see if we can buy, find you know, folks to purchase, other entities, but you know, to, to sit here and, and you know, not, I think, and I'm not saying that this is what, you know, everybody's been trying to work the angles that we're trying to work, but, you know, I, I really believe we have to make that, we have to be our own best advocates and really underscore, you know, the, the trust is about clean energy. This community has been about clean energy. We actually were willing to be the sort of guinea pigs in this exercise and it really backfired in an enormous way that has been detrimental to this community. And yet we continue to be committed and going forward. I think they, you know, they really need to hear that and not just the trust, but if it's, you know, the state treasurer's department, you know, the, the treasurer, then we need to speak with, you know, we need to speak with her and we need to really speak with the individuals that are, um, you know, making the decisions about this and put together a presentation um, because we are no closer to a resolution now than we were when we first started having this conversation a couple of years ago. We're really in the same spot. What, what you've noted is what we're suggesting that the board authorize if you're so willing. Yeah, Doug Brown. So can we have a little more uh, information about anybody that showed interest in these? Because I know Ms. Mullen said that, you know, response was modest, but we never really got a list of what the offers were. And what was that um, brokerage firm that wanted to negotiate a deal? I, I, don't, I don't have it um, with me. I mean, I don't have the letters in front of me, but um, we can transmit them to you. It was really, they're really broad. It wasn't a, you know, it was just a letter of interest. And we, and Julian, I think was, it was authorized by the board. It was the advertisement, um, but we can dig up that information and get that to you. And have we tried even, uh, you know, putting them up for free? You know, is there some industrial company somewhere that's using a ton of electricity that might use them, you know, salvage them? to save a little money on electricity in their business. And we should try everything. Cause right now, like you said, 
for us to take him down and put him up again somewhere else, we're really going to probably waste a lot more money. So if we can just give these things away, and if we can't, I, I suggest we just demolish them on site and sell the metal for scrap and just not waste any more time and money on them. Chris, can yeah, you talk a little bit more about that procurement issue of, you know, if we found somebody, if we didn't, that's the the, the box we're in is, is sure. the process that you go to, to find somebody. Sure, um, the offers and a certain, uh, I took a brief look at the various responses that came in. Um, as Jennifer stated, that there were some people willing to uh, try to broker the dismantling and, uh, and sale of them. However, to even do that, once again, it involves procurement issues for the town. It's dismantling of a public project that has to be bid under the current regulations, right? And then for the disposal of the town's property, that's a separate procurement. So once again, coming back to what we were talking about before and that both Jennifer and Julian uh, stated was to be able to talk to the Massachusetts Clean Water Trust and certainly, uh, you know, go forward with all of the efforts that the town has made and the, if you will, the box that it finds itself in and try to come up with a workable solution um, to both the debt and as, uh, as you've stated, the burden that these have been on the town and then try to come up with some vehicle via special legislation or otherwise to permit it to move forward without an enormous risk to the town. That may be, for example, um, you know, dismantling and sale, but there's no easy way to do that right now. And I suggest it would not be in the town's best interest to put out a procurement to merely dismantle these and then have them sitting somewhere um, because the person who dismantles them may, if we're uh, permitted to, we may be able to involve the disposition of them at the same time. But as it stands right now, those would be two separate procurements. And there's risk, as Frank said, at every step of a procurement. So we really want to try to find a way that right. works for the, the abatement trust and to relieve the town of the actual property, which is the turbines that are installed on their current location. I hope that helps answer the, your question. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Any other questions from the board? Well, honestly, okay. I thought I thought that's the same thing that we agreed, like you said, almost two years ago, at least a year ago, we were gonna engage the trust and try to work out a deal of some sort. I guess we've been working on the procurement issue for now. No, can I just mention one thing and correct me if I'm wrong, Julian, we have contacted the trust and the trust had said that um, they wanted to see the plan. They wanted to say, well, what are you exactly going to do with them? Well, we couldn't tell them because we needed to come up with the procurement. So it was like a, a paradox. Isn't that correct, Julian? Correct. Actually, the, the response we got back was that the Clean Water Trust was not going to make a decision until we came back to them with agreements for off-site relocation. And we laid out exactly what had been specified and what agreements were in place. Until then, they were not going to give us any indication as to uh, in, any decisions that they would make to relieve us of that debt burden. So but we're we're, we're hoping to approach it differently this time. Can someone just remind me though, did, weren't, was it not in regards to the um, Clean Water Trust? Was it, it, was it regarding the other turbine? When did we have a conversation with a offer of relief? We had an offer of some relief and that was like two years ago. I think that's when they gave us the credit for the amount of time that they had right. run. Oh, they gave us a modest credit. Okay. Oh, that credit. And then we also had another agreement that was relieved from the Mass Clean Energy Center. That that's what I'm. Thank you. I just. Yeah, that was um. That was the yeah. That was the Mass Clean Energy Center. We went back and forth, and they were really actually did. A, they were very good to us because they yes. had given us some upfront money for the turbines, and then they forgave it. We were going to um, pay them back with some rec credits. And then yes. we we're able to get that forgiven. Yes. So that is that that, that was still a go, correct? Yeah, that happened. That okay. must have happened about four or five years ago. But that was okay. completed. Yeah, okay. and that's all done. We were thank you. I, thank you. I I was um yeah, no. confusing the two. No, I appreciate that. Um 
Okay, so the directive is whether or not this board wants to try and approach, um, you know, to speak with the trust to try and address this issue and you need authorization from this board, correct? Correct. And who would be part of that group? Well, I think uh, Frank and I and Jennifer and and perhaps we would involve uh, Chris Morog, who's uh, who we'd like to bring in uh, to assist us in this regard. Okay. Um, any questions from the board? Do you expect to have any success when we still don't have a plan? It's kind of a catch twenty two. I mean, uh... well, our, our our view is that the circumstances have changed. Uh, there's been a you know, a, an incredible shift in terms of the situation. The pandemic is part of that. Um, and the town now has, with the two and a half million dollars appropriated for disposition that we took to town meeting and all the analysis we've done and the things that we've laid out in the uh, Jennifer's PowerPoint, uh, we're guardedly optimistic that the Clean Water Trust will take a fresh look at this. And if we can, at a minimum, relieve the town uh, in some acceptable way of this incredible uh, significant financial burden, uh, it would uh, make the equation much simpler. Keep in mind that no matter what we do, we still have about 10 years worth of annual payments on wind one that we borrowed with a 20 year bond uh, back when this seemed like, uh, you know, the uh, cutting edge thing to do. So uh, there are some consequences that'll continue to play themselves out no matter what we do. But we'd really prefer not to lay out a whole lot more cash uh, on something that is such a an incredibly uh, an emerging gamble, it, it would seem. Chris, can I ask you a question or Frank? So the the trust and the members of that trust, are they vested with the full authority to forgive the entirety of this grant, this loan? I'd have to look at that in more detail. I don't know the answer to that. Because, Frank, I I, okay, because I, I, my position would be, I don't think it is, I think we need to find out who has the final determination. And to me, part of the, this is, you know, a, 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 I understand there's legislative components to this, the statutory components rather about the process, but at the end of the day, the forgiveness of this loan is really, I think, there's a political, and I don't mean Democrat, Republican, but there's a, you know, these trusts are bodies that are appointed. We need, I, I personally think that we have to figure out who it is who has the final say. So if there's somebody above the trust who would have to okay it, I think we need to include part of that in the conversation. Because if we're just getting cut off at the knees because the trust is not open to it, there has to be, I would hope there would be another avenue of advocacy um, given that this hasn't been a particularly successful um, route for us so far. Um, so if we can find the answer to that, Julian. Yeah, Madam Chair, my memory in reviewing the documents and we'll confirm this and get back to the board is that the original agreement was with the predecessor to the Clean Water Trust. Mm -hmm. And so they have inherited that and they are the signatories on the agreement that uh, my predecessor as town manager executed on behalf of the town. Okay, but if we can if we can just find out the answer to that, are they the final decision makers, or is somebody else also part of that uh, process? That would be helpful because it's going to inform us as to who needs to be at the table or part of some level of discussions and where our representatives or folks that we know who can advocate for us where they need to be putting their their efforts. I think if we're just banging our head against the wall of speaking with the same group of folks over and over again who've said no or show us a plan, you know, I, I think we need to be a little bit more expansive in our conversations. Um, that would just be my my hope as we go forward. Do, we'll check and confirm okay. that. Do you need a vote from this board? I would welcome a vote from the board allowing us to um, begin to take that next step uh, to contact the Clean Water Trust and we'll do this background uh, confirmation as well that if there are any other entities involved in uh, that have any authority to uh, to uh, forgive the principal debt that the town uh, still is on the hook for, um, and also to uh, consider working with town council on the potential for special legislation. Again, I want to underscore what Frank said. 
the the layered procurement here is a, a nightmare. So being able to do a single procurement, which will require special legislation, would uh, really facilitate us coming to reasonable closure on this uh, uh, conundrum, which continues to go on year after year. Okay, so the the request is for both of those things. So to direct um, Frank to look into uh, special legislation around the issue of procurement and then to direct Julian along with uh, the folks he's noted to um, make contact and try and have conversations about the particular forgiveness of that loan. So do I have a motion to that effect? So we're getting kind of a mixed message. So we're, Mrs. Mullen has pointed out that to do this procurement process, even if we get the special legislation, it's very risky and it's not likely to be successful with only 10 years of useful life left on the turbines. So are we even wasting resources just chasing after the special legislation and the procurement Special process? Let us dispose of the turbines for parts also. We, we are going to need special legislation to All even right. take them down. Oh, I see. So okay. we can't take them down. So we're going to have to hire someone to dismantle them. And that implicates the 25A and the fact that we don't fall within it. So we're okay. going to need both. All right. Then. Okay. Thank you. Yep. What is the pleasure of this board? Sam, are you with us? Hard to use pleasure with this discussion. I, know, I know. Indeed, we understand. This is not a pleasant topic. Um, well, so I guess we have to move forward. I move that we authorize the town manager to move forward with negotiating, uh, hopefully a reduction in the liability to the Clean Water Trust. Okay, and, and what about the piece for Frank for the special legislation? Yes, I would also include a request that our um, town attorney investigate the uh, possibility of special legislation to enable us to engage the Procurement Act 25A. Thank you. Do I have a second? It, can, can I can I comment, please, before you go forward on that? Yes. I, I think um, you're getting too specific about 25A. It should yeah, be just not in general. Any, any general or special law to the contrary. For special legislation to effectuate whatever the agreement uh, may be with the Clean Water Trust. Okay, I'll Sounds adjust good. my motion as per Stated. our attorney's suggestion. Okay. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Joan, second. Okay, Joan, second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, um, by roll call, Taylor? Taylor, aye. Okay, Brown? Brown, aye. Jones? Jones, aye. Patterson? Patterson, aye. English Braga, aye. And uh, Mr. Suso, can you just keep us um, updated um, as to where that, that process is? I think it would be helpful as we prepare for that discussion that a member of the board um, participate in the process as we go forward, even if it's putting together whatever the presentation is going to be. Uh, as individuals who are elected to represent the, the taxpayers who are footing the bill for this, I think uh, one of us should, you know, participate. I'm not saying we have to be at the table necessarily, but in, in crafting whatever the discussion is going to be so we can address it as we go forward. I certainly welcome your designating um, each member of the select board. Uh, we would work closely with on that. Okay. Is anybody? Doug? Okay. Doug Jones will be the person who will work with you. Okay. Thank you. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, um, Jennifer, Frank, Chris. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank Good you. evening. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, okay. Right, next week. Oh, sorry. Um, next, we have an update on um, status on the drive in movies and musical events at Cape Cod Fairgrounds and related noise complaints. Um, Mr. Sousa will walk us through this, but We've been getting some complaints about the concerts and actually um, we've gotten 
uh, it's it's multiplied exponentially in the last week. We'd gone from having you know a few complaints here and there um, to I don't know we've received quite a few just in the last few days, um, and the complaints are essentially less about the movies, although there have been some complaints that the volume from the movies is loud, but the complaints have primarily been about the musical performances at the fairgrounds. So um, Mr. Suso met with um, individuals and he can kind of walk us through what took place at, at that meeting. Mr. Suso. Certainly. Happy to do so. On uh, this past Tuesday afternoon, October 20th, I met with representatives of Vivid Entertainment, uh, which was issued a special events permit uh, by the select board in August to allow an adjustment of the hours and days in operation and the ability to include live musical entertainment. Since that time, the town has received some complaints regarding noise emanating from the fairgrounds into the adjacent residential areas, both in Falmouth and Mashby. And as Madam Chair mentioned, uh, those uh, inexplicably, those seem to have uh, increased rather than decreased uh, even since I spoke with them. My purpose in meeting with Mr. Kevin Pacheco, general manager and assistant, uh, Ms. Elena Rogers was to strongly encourage enhanced cooperation and collaboration in the management of these fairgrounds events as it relates to noise issues. I ask specifically that they make every reasonable effort to tighten things up as it relates to noise emanating from the performances. They indicated they would indeed do so, acknowledging that noise complaints had indeed been received as well as at that time, at least three or four visits from the Falmouth Police responding to these excessive noise complaints. In addition, we've heard from some individuals in Mashpee, as I've noted. They confirmed uh, that they would closely comply with the hour, hour limitations specified by the board in your special permit and err in the direction of being more conservative and cautious. They can also confirm that at present, their plans are to have a scheduled concert. Again, was this, this was October 20th. Uh, on this past Friday, October 23rd and Sunday, October 25th and have one a remaining concert on this coming Friday, October 30th. I understand that some type of Halloween themed music is planned as well for Saturday, October 31st. As of our meeting on October 20th, they indicated no specific plans for concerts in the month of November, but did indicate that they had been contacted by quote, one or more groups, apparently affiliate, affiliated with the schools who asked about fundraising opportunities, which might involve a musical event. Not sure where that would be going. I did ask if that moved forward, that the town be notified with the details, with the reminder that it must comply with the state select board issued special event permit. Lastly, Vivid indicated that they might be interested in exploring some type of holiday theme drive through at the fairgrounds in the month of December, which could conceivably include some lighting and limited displays. I advise them that this would require a new special event permit to uh, from Wendy at the, uh, the fairgrounds manager who indicated that over the weekend, she had also received a number of uh, complaining telephone calls and voicemail messages, which she found very concerning, obviously. So I think that um, unfortunately, this problem continues to magnify. I can tell the board that uh, I reminded uh, um, Mr. Uh, Pacheco and Ms. Rogers that uh, while it, you know, the issuance of a special permit was not the call of the town manager but by the select board that this kind of uh, concerning uh, and expanding complaint situation uh, would certainly not reflect well on them, I would think, for future uh, potential events. So they certainly, uh, they indicated that they were aware of that and acknowledged it. And uh, that's my report to the board in attempting to reach out. Again, one uh, concert remaining, a musical event on Friday night and uh, the representation of a smaller one on Saturday and nothing for the month of November. Thank you, thank you for um, having that meeting so quickly. Doug Jones. And in the license, it says it's primarily acoustic. Have they had a single acoustic performance? Oh, I, I, I'm not aware of any specifically uh, uh, select Everything person. Everything I've heard general. about has been not acoustic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, the best and, of my and, knowledge, you're correct. 
and many band members. What we were also told it would be sort of four or five. And I, I've seen, you know, I've received as you guys have, you know, pictures where it's many more than four or five members in a band. Um, and it sounds as if it's been going pretty late, but. Well, is, do we have any, any option for canceling this Friday? I think they really violated the license application that we gave them in a number of ways. We talked quite a bit about the numbers and we gave them some sort of leeway of maybe five, maybe six. If they're exceeding that, if they're not doing acoustic as they promised, uh, if they're violating the noise, the noise bylaws and having the police called, I think that they've lost their right to do it this weekend. Anyone else? I, I'm not, okay. Yeah, I'm not in a good position to give much guidance on that, but I can tell you that they have advertised this Friday concert, similar to one that they came to you about earlier um, back in August. And I believe the uh, it's the same musical group, Crooked Coast, that uh, was brought to you with an appeal to allow them to have this uh, uh, final uh, musical event. I, I do want to note that to the best of my knowledge in working with the police department, they have... Uh, they have not exceeded the 10 p.m. limit that was placed by the board uh, for concert and musical events on Friday and Saturday nights that they have uh, wound down. Uh, the complaints seem to be centered around afternoon and then um, maybe the 9, 930 time period, but I don't recall being aware of any that were beyond 10 p.m. Nancy? Didn't they apply for a permit and then had to come back and we had to redo the permit? Is that correct? That's to correct. To accommodate them. And now we're getting all these complaints. I, I have to agree with, with Doug Jones that they they have violated it. And and really, they've lost the right to, to continue. I, I just think that we have done as much as we can do to support them. And, and I don't think that they're sticking to their part of the bargain. Any, anyone else, Sam or, or Doug? Well, it seems a shame to cancel them on their last weekend, but I mean, I thought they said after nine o'clock they were going to only use the little uh, radio transmission and knock off the, the loud PA system. Didn't That's they? after 9.30. 9.30. After 9.30 on your permit, Sunday okay. through Thursday, no amplified music outside of cars after 9.30, and on Friday and Saturday, <laughs> No amplified music outside of cars after 10 p.m. That's the way the permit was written and approved. Okay, right. Well, if it's not amplified out of people's cars, I guess they're just hearing it from the stage, obviously. Right. The biggest, the biggest complaint was the jive, the bass was vibrating the people's windows and stuff. I don't know if they could knock that off, but. I guess that's not acoustic. They they talk about primarily acoustic acts, and it just doesn't sound like that's what people are hearing. Yeah, to me. I think that was in the original uh, when it was going to be the opening Correct. for the movies, and then when they came back, they said, "Well, now we're kind of thinking that we should." They wanted to do concerts, so I don't know if that acoustic thing was still in play on the second approval. I, don't I think, think it, was, it was, but they just said it was primarily, not exclusively, is what they, they told us. So, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I guess my feeling would be that they have these two events, and I, I don't think that the permit should extend beyond the end of October. I think they should have to come back for special events. I mean, folks are, it's the end of summer, you know, it, folks are just, it's it's a different I don't, you know, everything slows down a little bit. People are are in their homes more. So they're going to be subject more to this loud noise. It's not beautiful weather where you're out later and, and maybe at the beach or out in other places. Folks are really primarily even more than they were this summer in their homes. So the idea of having these loud Sunday concerts or Friday night concerts going on indefinitely seems, you know, well beyond anything they represented to us. It seems as if the, it, the music has become the primary component of their business, more so than the drive-in movies. I think it has. Sam, Good. were you trying to say something? I, th I saw your little perimeter for speaking light up. 
Well, I, I'm I'm in agreement with you um, that there is and there they, they said that there was the option of them actually broadcasting audio into the cars through an FM channel that they could tune into, and but I, even then I, it strikes me that uh, they're going to be creating so much noise um, just in doing any kind of a performance that that probably wouldn't work for them. So I don't have a solution. Do we understand um, if they are sticking with the people staying in their cars or whether they're getting out and dancing? I don't know if we have any feedback. I think Scott McGann went to that first um, or someone from health department went to that first concert and we didn't get any negative feedback, but I don't know that we've had regular observations of that. I think that they've, uh, they're not staying specifically in their cars, but they have to stay at their car in their area. The license says they must remain in their vehicles. Okay. Yeah, I can't, I don't know. I haven't been to any of the events, so I can't. I haven't really... been to them either, but I thought I remembered that. Is there a sound limit if we allow them to happen this Friday night? Is there a sound limit we could impose? The, the, the only mechanism that we have, um, Doug, is if someone is uh, deems deems it excessive, they call the police. And the police department determines whether or not um, the uh, the volume is such that it is leaving the that area and going significantly into the adjacent residential areas. If so, they can be cited for violating the noise ordinance. But it's a judgment call on the part of the police officer. Can they be shut down at that point, or just told to turn it down? I think normally, I think the first step would be asking them to turn it down. And if you get a uh, additional complaint, they could ask them to uh, cease their you know, their performance. Nancy, have they been cited? Do you know? To the best of my knowledge, uh, the police have responded three to four times, uh, but no citations have been issued. I, th I think that that's was the last when we get the last update. That was my understanding. Yeah. Um, any other comments from the board or any action? Well, I think there should be some action. I think uh, Mr. Suso might speak with Mr. Pacheco again and advise him that he's very close to being shut down, at least. And if the noise isn't managed, then we will come out and shut it down. I don't know if that's going to be sufficient, but I, I would hope so. And then can we put a review of the license on for our first meeting? in November, Julian, Certainly. because yeah. I think at that point, um, we I do think that we need to have the applicant here, and I think we probably need to have a review of the license. I don't think that we can, we haven't noticed him to be here to, to, you know, to have a motion to rescind his license at this point, but I think we've received enough concern and complaint that it warrants the board having a, a, a conversation and a potential vote. Yeah, I should advise the board that I um, informed Mr. Pacheco that there would be a discussion at tonight's select yep. board meeting about the concerns here so that he is aware that this is being I, talked about. I like Mr. Brown's suggestion that you reach out to him, let him know that the we will have no problem with the police in response to a noise complaint coming out and shutting them down. And and along with that, noting that we the board intends to review the license in November. So invite them to come to the next meeting on November 9th. Yes. For that purpose. And I would also uh, comment to him what you said to us that after you met with him, the complaints increased, which is very concerning. It certainly seems that way. And he's aware that we were talking about this tonight and he chose not to be here. I think that speaks volumes. Okay. So with that, with that, thank you. And with so with that direction, Julian, can you just do that outreach and we'll put that on as our agenda for November to take a look at that. And that way the public can weigh in as well. Certainly, happy to do so. Thank you very much. Um, Okay, we have some meeting minutes, the September 28th, 2020 public session. Any um, edits? 
I didn't see any. Okay, do I have a motion motion to approve? I move approval. I own second. Okay, motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, by roll call, Taylor. Taylor, aye. Jones. Jones, aye. Brown. Brown, aye. Patterson. Patterson, aye. English Braga, aye. Thank you. Individual selectmen reports. Well, I uh, attended the assembly meeting last week and we got a presentation from Cape Cod Commission, uh, Christy Senatory and Jennifer Clinton. And Jennifer Clinton was the primary uh, person who did the survey of business survey on the Cape. They did two, they're gonna do a third. Uh, it's like half of the businesses, these are mostly retail, restaurant and service industry. Half of them were not sure that they were gonna be able to survive another year if current conditions persisted. So that was pretty concerning. Um, Ron Bergstrom uh, mentioned that the uh, commissioners had uh, decided to spend $990,000 on a hydrographic survey for dredging. So our new dredging manager is very smart about his planning and he, he wants to know what he's going into so he can maximize his efficiency. So I, I like the way that the, uh, the dredging is kicking off this year. Um, those are the two biggest highlights. Uh, we actually authorized a uh, purchase of some uh, firefighting equipment for doing um, uh, wildlife, uh, man you know, uh, forestry management. So there was a forestry firefighting company that was owned by, uh, let's see, I don't remember if I wrote down the name, uh, but the person who uh, was closing the business because he took a job working for the county or the, for the fire department, so he couldn't have this conflict of interest. So now we're going to have this resource where uh, the county will own this uh, trailer and this little ATV unit that pulls it out into the woods and a bunch of hoses. And I think they have 20 um, firefighting suits and all kinds of equipment. So we'll be able to do these controlled burns now and it'll be a service that the county can provide. And so that's a good, good new thing to have. I also attended the uh, Long Range Venue Transportation Task Force on Thursday. And it was an ongoing discussion about um, trying to reduce traffic to the vineyard and whether or not the Steamship Authority has a role in that or if it's primarily uh, zoning and, and planning that has to be done by the vineyard itself. So it's, uh, these are no clear cut victories in these meetings. We're just sharing information and sharing thoughts and in our initial steps, trying to formulate a, uh, a plan to try to tackle this. And uh, I've had a conversation with the uh, port manager in New Bedford and they're still on track for uh, late fall, early winter start to their uh, project in the North Port Terminal in New Bedford. So they expect and hopefully will be up and running in uh, sometime at this time in 2022. So that will be part of our long range planning is to keep those options open. And I believe we're gonna have a discussion at our next meeting about this, uh, New Bedford option and go through the finances and the history of what they tried to do the first time. And so I, I thought previously that the, uh, the freight hauling out of New Bedford was actually profitable for the hauler. And I guess it was, but it was only because the Steamship Authority was subsidizing it. And I think that's part of the reason why they chose to end it. So even though I thought I knew quite a bit about this, I'm learning a lot as we go along. Great. Thank you. Yeah, really something that continues to be a challenge. Right. Um, anyone else? Sam, I know you're on the phone, but. Yep, given the technical difficulties, okay. I'll pass. Okay, um, Julian, uh, town manager's report, please. Certainly, thank you. Uh, on this past Thursday afternoon, I and a few staff members met with uh, Sam Patterson, Mike DiGiano and others from the EDIC on their draft consultants report on feasibility for a community broadband network. Um, I also uh, joined uh, select person uh, Doug, Doug Brown at the uh, long-term vineyard transportation task force meeting on Thursday evening as well. Um, I wanted to confirm that submissions are beginning to arrive, or I should say they have arrived from town departments on the proposed fiscal year 2022 budget. Internal deliberations and review will be forthcoming soon as we approach what is shaping up uh, as a most challenging budget year. 
Uh, as we know, the annual Halloween scarecrows have begun to appear downtown. I wanted to confirm that Veterans Services is planning a virtual Veterans Day observance, similar to the process followed for Memorial Day, given the COVID-19 limitations. My compliments to them for continuing to move that uh, very important observance forward. The board's next meeting is Monday, November 9th. Town meeting will convene, convene the following Monday, November 16th, as uh, previously announced. That concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder, we have an election. Doesn't matter how you're voting, but I hope everybody votes. Our clerk's office has made it really easy to do it in a safe, healthy way. And just a thanks in advance for all of their hard work and to all of the folks who are poll workers, um, just making sure we, we have a smooth election. So uh, we will see you on November 9th. Thank can you, I everyone. Up, a motion. Uh, oh, can I just yep. follow up quickly? I forgot to mention something that was interesting to learn at the uh, Steamship Authority meeting. Uh, some of the vineyard business owners that were participating in the meeting were really pleased with the fall season that they're having. And also Steamship Authority mentioned that their revenues are really up because there's so many people that have gone to the vineyard and have stayed there that the freight is busy and the, uh, you know, the island is doing pretty well right now, surprisingly, economically, doing a little recovery. So I thought I'd share that. Thank you. Anything else? I move we adjourn, Jones. Second, Brown. Okay, all those in favor? Taylor? Taylor, aye. Brown? Brown, aye. Jones? Jones, aye. Patterson? Patterson, aye. English Braga, aye. Thank you, everyone. Sam, thank you for sticking around.